Раз, раз. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to start the first um, um, section at the round table. My name is to Piotr Lechowski, and I am from the Jan Karski Institute in Warsaw, and I have the honor to moderate this panel, which as of the um, one would be only on uh, uh, stationary form. I am very happy about it. Before we go into our discussion, I would like to present our speakers. Uh, just uh, um, um, Barbara Yondo Kaliszewska from Łódź, Łódź University. Uh, uh, PhD Grzegorz Kostrzewa um, uh, Zorba from the Army Academy, Technical um, uh, Academy in Warsaw. Um, PhD Victor Ross, uh, uh, Center for European Studies, uh, Eastern European Studies, uh, and uh, PhD Sławomir Wereniuk from the University of Marie um, uh, Curie Skłodowska in Lublin. We are going to start from the short speeches of our speakers, then we we will talk about uh, individual issues and at the very end if we have time and if the public will want we will have a short panel discussion so I would like to ask um, um, PhD Barbara Ayurno Kaliszewska to deliver her speech. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome sincerely in the center of the discussion. This is the uh, break room of the uh, 80s and 90s um, of the last century. So the moment when Lithuania becomes independent uh, as the first um, um, state in the internal um, um, uh, bloc. What should we remember about today? Most of all, the fact that the scale of the po support of the Polish uh, government, Polish organizations, uh, Polish public opinion for independent uh, um, um, wishes of Lithuanians can be compared only to the solidarity with Ukrainians. So that is why I would like to shortly present uh, um, the most important uh, gestures or um, other forms of support. Although the register or the catalog of these support events is very long, so it's very important to remember that the first visit that was paid by the solidarity activities, uh, uh, so the first uh, um, um, foreign visit um, took place in Poland to the invitation of the um, um, solidarity of Poland. Um, on the 11th of um, 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 uh, March uh, 91. On this, uh, uh, there were the parliament the MPs from Poland in the Lithuanian Parliament who declared support for the decision of uh, Vilnius. Uh, in this uh, place, it was important. On the 12th of March, it was planned to have the meeting of the um, uh, deputies. Um, uh, were for the first uh, uh, time in the history um, uh, the president was to be elected and um, it was Mikhail Gorbachev who was uh, elected we couldn't we didn't know how the situation could uh, change uh, in when in uh, April 1990 Moscow the announced economic blockade of Lithuania this is for the first uh, um, time in the history sanctions were left it, it is the Poland uh, who um, um, uh, stopped uh, some uh, fees for parcels. They planned some uh, storage uh, for these uh, times. Uh, so and then in um, um, January 91, so when the um, Russian ta uh, Soviet tanks uh, are in the roads, 14 civils uh, um, were killed. One Soviet uh, soldier, Polish um, parliament MPs, um, uh, everybody is in the uh, 
surrounded uh, parliament and in the streets of Vilnius, and they support uh, uh, the uh, Lithuanian society. At that point, um, um, as Minister Saudergas uh, uh, comes uh, to Warsaw uh, to um, um, create a government on exile. So this is the first in for Lithuanian um, um, uh, bureau, uh, which is to be the uh, opening uh, window for the true information uh, into the world where we could see that Poles were supporting Lithuanians a lot. The scale of support was absolutely huge because we often forget that outside Poland um, there was uh, Polish emigration, uh, the uh, culture Jerzy um, Gedroic um, uh, associated with Edgy uh, Gedroic who um, uh, talked about Lithuanian issues outside USSR they try to activate international opinion. Uh, we have to remember about the role of the Polish Pope, who also uh, financially uh, supported uh, uh, our case. Um, and also Lithuanian emigration was uh, actively participated. Obviously, it seemed that um, this uh, start of the diplomatic relations uh, due to which we meet today um, um, was supposed to be without any problems. However, when we talk about the relationship between Poland and Lithuania, there were a few factors which were very important. The first thing was that Poland did not ac acknowledge independent uh, independence um, uh, in 1990, but in the second half of the 1991. Another element was the question of the Polish minority and its rights. Um, which um, um, influenced the uh, Polish-Lithuanian um, relationships. Um, so in Poland, uh, we don't know the topic of uh, uh, the fact that Polish-Lithuanian uh, um, declaration was difficult to be signed because Lithuanians uh, um, demanded uh, to put uh, uh, apologists for uh, Zeligowski's um, opposition. Zeligowski's um, revolt. Uh, why wasn't um, um, independence? Uh, um, um, maybe, maybe Director Kostrzewa Zorbas will tell us why it was not uh, uh, accepted um, in the 90, but uh, in the second half of the 91. Thank you very much. I would like to ask you to show my presentation. This is the vision, uh, the project the, 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 which was implemented by Poland in the years uh, um, um, that we are going to talk about within this round uh, table, so uh, 89 to 92. And here you can see the uh, map of Central and Eastern Europe with um, uh, emphasis um, on um, um, identity, uh, the names of the uh, stoli uh, capitals in their languages. So at that time, Kiev was not in uh, I Ukrainian. So uh, before uh, 1989, this map uh, was uh, drawn in 1984. And for the first time was published one year later together with the first uh, new coalition. This is the multi-language um, magazine. I was the founder and uh, uh, the editor-in-chief until 1989. This is uh, the the, 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 the cover is in 12 uh, languages, uh, English as global, Polish, because it was in Poland, in Warsaw, um, um, and in 10 other languages of the Central and Eastern Europe. So as here you can see uh, the appeal um, included in this um, area. So it was not the constant element. The map was the fixed one in 85 and 89. 
This is the appeal to the opposition um, into emigration um, and Ukrainian, Lithuanian, and Belarus um, um, communities um, to get rid of the disputes regarding the territories um, um, uh, and wanting to get uh, former borders in place, former territories. Um, Uh, Polish government wanted to have this vision. It was executed. I was invited. Um, I was invited to work to execute it after the conceptual phase. And uh, in the years 1990 uh, and 1991, I was the deputy director in the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs for um, uh, Foreign Affairs, and from the 91, uh, the director of the planning and analysis of uh, um, Ministry of Foreign uh, Affairs. Uh, I'm happy to share my knowledge uh, from the very center of this affairs because I was not only the witness of the history by was called um, creator of these events um, um, I would like to shortly um, briefly show you the Central Europe please show the next slide because my remote control doesn't work this is another issue with other editor, uh, with other issuer. Next slide, please. Václav Havel. Uh, you can see that he's got a, long, a lighter with a solidarity logo, which was smuggled to Prague. And this is the V um, victory sign uh, wishing the um, opposition to win, which was supported by Solidarity and New Coalition. And his um, uh, hope for success and we wishing success came true because this map, which uh, came up in 19. Um, um, this is the map of the Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so, um, the objectives, the dominant objectives, not the only ones. Uh, there were obviously some exceptions. Um, various um, um, uh, communities, um, they try to execute other concepts. But these um, uh, objectives were the ones which were executed by uh, subsequent governments and were achieved. Especially the new, uh, um, new co coalition. So building uh, amicable uh, rep re relationships with the countries uh, from certain Eastern Europe um, gaining independence and also supporting their independence and trying to uh, not to rise any disputes over the borders. Um, now the borders become obvious, but then they were not. Uh, so a natural um, situation. Uh, was uh, uh, there was a restitution of the former territories, which would mean a war everybody with everybody, and the biggest threat here f for um, trials to gain independence, um, for um, survival of the nations and the uh, people. And central uh, um, um, authorities, including KGB, were interested in uh, disputes, territorial disputes. 
especially Polish-Lithuanian and Polish-Ukrainian conflict. So we could see quite a lot of conflict here. So here, um, uh, in, in case of chaos, uh, Soviet army would uh, uh, step in to as peacemakers and uh, restitute would restitute so-called peace. Then, uh, then the dissolution of the structures of this uh, Eastern Bloc, which was uh, partly important for the structures, and it was very important as the element which is connect interconnected. <clears throat> in that Poland didn't want uh, the uh, Warsaw uh, Treaty uh, be the uh, instrument to restitute uh, pressure and making dependence um, of the sea countries. Um, so the question of the Warsaw deal um, not to be um, uh, done and then getting Russian uh, Soviet army out of Poland um, <clears throat> it was the most difficult uh, of all the tasks and so complex uh, that it uh, required um, um, Uh, the basic rules, uh, I will not read them out. I would like to encourage you to read it yourself. It will be quicker. I just would like to make some short uh, additions. Uh, in the first point, uh, the policy, non-reactive uh, uh, policy, but creative policy. So not only between the fear and the hope, as it is put in the title of the p p um, uh, panel, because between the fear and the hope uh, is uh, uh, waiting what will happen. And Poland was creating the future. What, I would like to draw your attention to the second point, um, uh, g uh, um, confirming the uh, independence of uh, um, Ukraine. Um, uh, I presented this notion um, uh, to Krzysztof Bielecki um, um, with uh, omitting the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Prime Minister um, did um, accept it. This is a two-way policy and addition for about um, um, uh, avoiding the idea of federation and also avoiding other danger, uh, meaning from promoting Polish leadership, we were evasive. We were evasive when we talk about the, the Poland wants to be a regional um, master state um, um, and to uh, dominate other countries of the Central and Eastern Europe. So it was not easy, given uh, the ambitions and the historical um, thoughts of the first uh, Republic of Poland as the empire. Uh, so uh, without emphasizing uh, that everybody is equal, we would not be able to achieve the success. So I would like to um, address it to today's politicians and diplomats today. And uh, some comment to the last point, instead of autonomy. Uh, there was yet another element. There was the territorial self-government. Poland um, um, disregarded Polish autonomy, on the, especially in Lithuania, but it promoted um, self-government equal for all the citizens, uh, for all the um, territories of individual states and via self-government, apart from the general issues, uh, when we talk about um, the um, uh, um, when we talk about the problems, um, uh, so these needs would be satisfied. Um, so in most cases, uh, not only in today's Belarus, but uh, in all the other countries, um, and not in Russia, but in other countries, uh, European countries uh, of Eastern Europe and Central Europe. But it was also difficult and time consuming. And uh, the talks, um, uh, the um, delays uh, when we talked about the Polish and Lithuanian relationship uh, was the result of uh, these problems.
And uh, finally, um, I'd like to say that the doctor uh, has just mentioned that the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania was sent uh, to Warsaw to uh, establish the uh, government, Lithuanian uh, government in exile, and it uh, had its office in my office. I gave him my office and my uh, and phones, uh, so he phoned, uh, he called various uh, politicians uh, worldwide. For example, he called Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Director, for um, uh, this great deal of very interesting information, say, first-hand information. But staying here now with diplomats, uh, let me give the floor to the former ambassador, Mr. Uh, Victor Ross. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me the floor. So uh, Director uh, Grzegorz Kostrzewa uh, Zorbas uh, started uh, uh, his uh, speech from his sort of first uh, most important uh, uh, problems, issues that uh, were related to Polish steps aimed uh, at these um, endeavors in the first years, we, we know there was kind of a division. Even then, there was also uh, uh, the government and uh, the, uh, the the opposition, etc. And later on, uh, Eastern policy, uh, Poland's Eastern policy was created. There are various uh, uh, concepts, first the Promethean uh, uh, concept, and there were also more cautious uh, concepts at the time. Anyhow. It seems uh, that uh, the very uh, title of our uh, conference now between fear and hope is a kind uh, suitable for, let's say, press, for media. And our meeting is not, let's say, strictly a scientific one, because these are our, let's say, reflections on uh, what uh, happened within the 30 years and the consequences of, of these events. So let me now um, tell you about the, the first steps. My first meeting in the for Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, took place because I was invited there to, by the vice director of the department, and his role then was really uh, uh, very, let's say, powerful. Uh, it had more powers uh, uh, than uh, his position would indicate. And Minister Skubiszewski was not an expert in Eastern issues. That's why he entrusted um, the development of Eastern policy rules uh, to the people who had been working on it for many years and had already had a kind of concept ready. So this concept of, let's say, twin track policy that is uh, recognizing still the Soviet authorities because they were still there, not dissolved, and at the same time uh, supporting independence endeavors. And the, well, the, the, they were many, ma mainly um, manifested in various declarations of the independence of, of these countries, and that was not recognized by the, uh, Soviet, the then Soviet Union. And well, uh, that meant that they had such really endeavors, and Poland uh, did support uh, such endeavors of these uh, countries. And next, I will. Uh, uh, discuss some practical uh, aspects of the first uh, steps of creating Polish diplomatic uh, missions in, in the East. So after exchanging diplomatic notes between uh, the ministries, the ministers, and these notes already uh, recognized uh, the independence, Poland immediately started establishing embassies, not in all the countries at the same time. Sometimes it took a few years. Nevertheless, in the majority of the states, the relations were based on this uh, sort of tough basis, that is, uh, embassies uh, were established already. So my first uh, steps uh, I took in Moscow as a deputy ambassador of, of the then ambassador, Mr. Uh, Chausek. Uh, there I uh, learned the basics of diplomatic work. So I had to know how to write uh, notes and cables. 
uh, ambassador, um, uh, ambassador Josek had never learned that because he wrote very long uh, sort of papers in his cables for two and two have a pages, whereas such a cable should contain just one or two sentence with uh, unambiguous conclusions. But, well, of course, that was the problem uh, for uh, people who, who were uh, involved in the decrypting all these documents, that was a certain problem for them. Okay, but as for political uh, mood in the embassy in Moscow, was not so clear. Mr. Czosek was still the representative of the Polish left, and he had never renounced his views. His expectations were such that, I mean, the Soviet Union would not collapse just like that. He thought it would not be impossible. Even if it collapsed, had collapsed then, then still attempts were uh, made at somehow uh, not recognizing that. And that was not uh, in line with the views of most of the staff of the Polish embassy in Moscow. Anyhow, the relations between us were difficult then. And then I uh, was promoted to ambassador, but to a much smaller country, that is Moldova. And uh, then I encountered kind of fundamental difficulties that Polish diplomats uh, uh, had when they entered a new area, when nothing was really prepared, frankly speaking. We knew that we had to recognize these countries and to forge diplomatic relations with them and establish embassies there. But the question was, what kind of policy should we pursue towards them? What are our expectations of them and vice versa? That was not clear. The embassy had to be established within more or less two years by really overcoming huge difficulties, kind of technical difficulties to first to find the building. Uh, to equip it with uh, the appropriate uh, facilities. That was a great difficulty. But with the passage of time, we managed to do that. Even uh, we uh, short, uh, briefly, uh, shortly pre pre preferred uh, uh, president's uh, visit. So Moldovan president uh, uh, visited Poland soon. Then Peter Wojcinski, his uh, 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 also uh, ne the next pres president, uh, visited Warsaw, so we organized such visits in a very short time, and so we show the kind of pattern and were leader in uh, this systemic transformation. So everyone was looking then in Poland uh, uh, as if we were a guide then. So they really followed what we do in a way, but we had problems implementing uh, everything, all, all these uh, rules that we wanted to there locally. And what I remember is the, my kind of incidental visit. I was in Paris and I went to Maison Lafitte to hold a discussion with Jerzy Gedroyc, and we actually met, myself and Gedroyc. And when I presented to him these expectations, possibilities that Moldova has as a, as a country almost, let's say, bordering Poland, but quite close to Poland anyhow, at least we had such a border before the Second World War. Then Jerzy Gedroyc, great editor-in-chief, uh, took a, a receiver and started calling sort of big, big companies, let's put it like that, which were to help us uh, solve problems of economic cooperation, that is to increase uh, trade volumes, etc. So, well, the outcome, we don't know if it was really very good, but anyhow, the very energy, the vision of uh, the um, formerly UAB and relations with uh, these, let's say, Eastern European countries, I mean, smaller countries, less important countries, was really uh, of great importance and it was visible. So maybe that's it for me as regards, let's say, the first uh, uh, sentences about uh, this topic. Hope, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, we, we hope it's just a brief introduction. You will tell us more in a moment. So in our discussions, many interesting uh, 
uh, theses were made. Of course, normally the, the last uh, speaker has the most difficult uh, 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 task, but I hope Mr. Uh, Swavamir Veramuk uh, will cope with it well. So now the floor is yours. OK, I will do my best. So uh, following uh, Victor Ross's uh, path, I'd like to start with a question, fear or hope? And I'd like to focus more, maybe not on Poland, but Poles, Polish people. Myself, as a student of the last year of history in uh, 1989, I was very hopeful uh, about what was going on. I was observing very thoroughly the social uh, economic scene uh, in Poland. I was active in uh, uh, students' uh, organizations, which were anti-communist organizations, together with my friends. We followed, we held discussions. We were really very, very helpful. And I remember how hopeful I was when I went to buy Gazeta Wyborcza, uh, were in which the outcome uh, of the first uh, election uh, were to be published. I mean, and then I remember the first uh, totally free elections, and I voted for uh, Valenza. And I was also disappointed after the first round of the June election then. But a great uh, um, disappointment was me, something that I was observing, like this uh, election of Poland's uh, president. And that was the first president was in Free Poland, General Jaruzelski, who imposed martial law in Poland. And then I was observing Janaev's coup. So when I was invited to the conference, I read the interview of Grzegorz Kosheva Zorbas in one of the books, and the title Lewiczewcowy. And that was a very important book for me. And uh, that was also the basis uh, for me uh, being later on uh, carrying out scientific research into these issues. And I wouldn't be so optimistic today. And now we have some perspective, yes, because I'm not so uh, optimistic about what was going on in 1989. 1992 in Poland, because still we have no answer to key questions. That is, was Poland then a subject of international relations? To what extent we were a sort of sovereign, we were able to make independent decisions, whether the concept of becoming uh, Finland uh, wasted uh, society's energy. Uh, let's remember the Polish, Poland was the uh, leader of these transformations of uh, the uh, People's Spring, but after a year and a half, we became an outsider of these transformations because our neighboring countries um, were much more advanced. Uh, they uh, um, made these changes much more uh, much faster and much more effectively. That's what it seemed, at least. So based on my, my research and my PhD thesis and analytical work, I still express doubt whether we were independent in our policy, whether our concept could have been considered and implemented. And definitely, uh, Mr. Grzegorz Kosheva Zorbas uh, introduced some uh, uh, positive aspects here, that is, uh, recognition of Ukraine independence, uh, Weimar Triangle. That w they, these were very important achievements. And we can also say that nothing around uh, the Soviet Union could happen without the knowledge of, of the Soviet Union. That was that we used to say at the time. And then Poland had its five minutes. And we know from history that uh, fighting for more freedoms always took place when powers changed the Kremlin. That was in, uh, 20, in 1923, 56, uh, 64, when th resulting from these fights between various fractions, Poland um, broadened its uh, let's say, sovereign uh, uh, powers. And that was also during the Solidarity uh, Carnival in 1980. So always these um, fights between fractions always made it possible for Eastern Bloc uh, states uh, to fight for their freedoms. So also this period, uh, 1989, uh, 1992, as uh, Mr. Zorbas, uh, Grzegorz Kostrzewa Zorbas said, that maybe uh, 
the fight uh, for uh, abolishing some kind of uh, various structures like Warsaw Pact and um, uh, the Council of Mutual uh, Assistance to fight against them. But thanks to, to that, we broadened our sovereignty and uh, making um, decision making uh, decision by Poland that was important for us. Why I'm not so optimistic? Because we're analyzing this short period of time, taking into account the reasons for what happened in 1993, I was then, I don't know whether it was a coincidence that the last transport of Soviet troops left Poland. That was 18th uh, September when they crossed Eastern Bo Poland. And then parliamentary uh, election was held at the same time, r right after that. So, and then uh, we might have an impression that this period of uh, regaining uh, sovereignty uh, stopped because um, those uh, who were in power in the socialist uh, Poland uh, Republic took power again. So to sum up this brief introduction, I'd like now to think together with uh, uh, other uh, speakers at the today's conference whether indeed Poland was at the time uh, the country that took sovereign decisions to what extent uh, we could do it, really, and whether Western uh, powers had impact on uh, broadening our uh, sovereignty. Thank you so much. Thank you, doctor. And now we have finished the first round of our round uh, table. Now we will open uh, the second round, and it would refer to something that has been mentioned by doctor, and but I would also like ask uh, the uh, speakers about the sort of tr twin track uh, policy and the process of forging relations with particular states, because we are now celebrating the years of that. So on the one hand, still the Soviet Union and then the Russia. And on the other hand, new states uh, being created. So now let's state, uh, let's start with diplomatic let's say, circles. Uh, that is um, Ambassador Grzegorz Kosciewa Zorbas. There was a difference between uh, recognizing the in independence or, uh, to be more exact, um, the independent states that um, had had no legal continuity or, uh, or the history of being recognized by the international community and in particular Western, uh, the Western world, and the countries uh, with a longer history of independence, that is the Bal Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. So in the 1920s, 1930s, these countries were called uh, the Baltic states, and the same term is also uh, used right now, although, of course, we know that there are many more uh, states located on the Baltic uh, Sea. So the Poland, Polish diplomacy between 1990 and 1991 claimed that uh, Poland uh, had never ceased to recognize uh, the independence of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. And what um, Poland's diplomacy did after Janajew's coup, coup was uh, uh, reinstating um, diplomatic relations and not just starting diplomatic relations uh, from scratch. In the case of other states, the situation was such that they had no such continuity. Annexation of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia by the Soviet Union was never recognized by part of Western countries, especially by the United States of America. Although, practically, it had no importance, but uh, from the international and um, international law, uh, 
that was important. It was difficult to understand by society, but yeah, diplomacy had to follow such rules. In the case of uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and other the then uh, Soviet republics, we could be also looking, of course, for their uh, historical say, counterparts, like attempts at creating a Belarusian state in, in 1918, and several attempts at creating the Ukrainian state uh, right after the First World War. But that was, let's say, too little, too far in history without any lasting international consequences. And therefore, in all these cases, Poland recognized uh, newly uh, created independent states uh, that were formed on the basis of the former Soviet uh, republics. And this element of continuity of uh, Soviet power enabled to avoid any conflicts, war, territorial wars that were ongoing. Maybe not were still <laughs> ongoing, but uh, there was a threat of it in Yugoslavia. The, the Central and Eastern Europe managed to avoid, except for a uh, Transcaucasia region, which is far away say, from Europe. So it avoided a war uh, against everyone, which broke out in the collapsing Yugoslavia, and it, which, which required great military intervention on the part of NATO. Is it a sufficient uh, answer? Yes, thank you. So could you please, I would like to um, ask Ambassador uh, Rossia to uh, dwell on that. Uh, how did it look like because you were at the diplomatic post at that time? Well, I just would like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, really Poland uh, was well ahead uh, uh, when we talk about its decision making and the will to promote uh, the independent uh, independence once Ukraine announces uh, its um, um, uh, independence. Uh, the Ukrainian president uh, is uh, elected uh, with a great majority. The USA is hesitant, uh, uh, being afraid that acceptance of Ukraine and collapse of the USSR would be the beginning of the big um, um, uh, war in the uh, USSR and uh, the, having the nuclear weapons. And it was uh, necessary to be very brave to uh, be the first country to acknowledge uh, Ukraine. Uh, Lithuania also accepted it, if I remember it correctly, straight away. So it seems that uh, at that uh, time we uh, had a big wave of um, uh, independent wills, which was uh, done by uh, national um, powers. Uh, it was not divided into individual parties, um, uh, but this was like people's movement, uh, which was supposed to show that these states uh, were um, somehow um, uh, destroyed um, when we talk about its intelligence, its languages, and so on. Um, so uh, at the beginning, it was the Baltic states, and then Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova. Um, um, the national wills were suppressed. So uh, we, I think, did uh, everything possible to break these fear out. Uh, in the Polish democratic uh, societies, environments, uh, we had examples of uh, position, initiating position um, to show the changes in the first uh, um, meeting of solidarity in 1981. It was the first meeting of solidarity. It was the appeal <clears throat> which was uh, posed by Jan Lipinski 
the appeal to the Eastern nations um, where we encourage to create independent trade unions, similarly as it was done in Poland. And it was clear signal to open a new game which will mean that the communist structures um, will collapse. So uh, this was one of the main reasons uh, that the Soviets uh, will um, uh, want to have the common front and also Polish influence on the uh, Soviet uh, uh, republics would be uh, demolishing for total totalitarian system. So I would like to say uh, we did everything uh, p possible. Uh, obviously, there was fear among elites. Uh, if we get reminded uh, the uh, movement of Lech Wałęsa, um, so there was an um, outstanding telegram which was sent out, uh, which was the ex expressing that um, there is a big anxiety of what can happen. And uh, there is um, Mikhail Gorbachev, which was quite ambiguous, who is uh, perceived as the um, person who brought about uh, um, uh, freedom, but he was under strong influence of the uh, conservative elements in the Soviet uh, um, elements, uh, uh, the um, um, army, getting army into Vilnius and uh, Riga uh, was the um, evidence of uh, this. Even when Gorbachev uh, was isolated in Krim, for me personally, it was absolutely clear that if um, uh, um, Panayev uh, wins, then Soviet uh, Russia would uh, um, um, act differently. Then he would uh, be in Moscow as the uh, ally um, of this conservative uh, movement. The um, Boris Yeltsin um, came to uh, greet him, but he didn't shake his hands because he said that, uh, thank you very much, comrade uh, Gorbachev. And all this concern um, of Yeltsin to uh, free Soviet republics, to get them out, and obviously um, encourage by the management in uh, uh, Moscow to declare independence. It was the will to get rid of this central Moscow um, elite like Gorbachev and his people towards um, these uh, so-called democrats, reformers, who then turn out God knows who. Um, but um, this was the trend at that time. Our policy of um, uh, dual actions um, had some fears. What happens if, OK, we want to support uh, this independence uh, of republic, but if it turns out uh, that Moscow is too strong to allow it, then um, it, uh, we would be not much in favor of uh, Moscow. We would be uh, threatened by uh, them. Uh, so this was the question also about the German movement. Uh, I think the Germans were thinking whether there will be some re uh, revisionist uh, tendencies uh, uh, concerning Polish borders. Um, um, and maintain relations with Moscow that could turn out uh, positive. I personally, I couldn't understand it, maybe because uh, uh, this is my temperament that uh, uh, when we have this democratic wave all over Europe and all the uh, Central and Eastern Europe countries got to independence and the Germans are happy that there is the um, union um, of uh, Germany so it's difficult to imagine the border issues. But in the policy of this uh, dual um, actions, there is this uh, ambiguous uh, um, uh, issue of the policy. 
Uh, so when in the plant of uh, reunion of Germany, uh, the um, chancellor of the um, uh, Helmut Kohl, there was no uh, eastern border of uh, Germany. There was nothing about uh, Polish-German border. It was. Uh, um, just to be the uh, better of um, the um, um, right-wing party in Germany. Um, but Poland couldn't disregard uh, of this uh, um, lack of uh, uh, borders in the program, and that is why there was a big effort of the Polish diploma of Polish diplomacy uh, in, uh, in the mid 1990. Um, we got the international guarantees uh, uh, about Polish German border, which happened um, in the uh, so called um, Treaty 2 plus 4 about the reunion of the uh, of, of Germany, but it was countersigned uh, in summer 1990, um, um, signed in the at the beginning of uh, end of April, um, August, or beginning of uh, September. Then Poland started new diplomatic efforts, especially they brought up uh, the uh, question of uh, presence of the Soviet army in Poland. So brought up, um, um, they demanded to for the, the army to um, go out of Poland, but it was um, divided in sequences so that we do not fight on two fronts at the same time. First, uh, let's uh, have international um, multinational guarantees for the uh, uh, western border of Poland, and then let's talk about uh, uh, the um, eastern um, uh, issues with uh, big energy. So thank you very much, Mr. Director, for this uh, important uh, voice um, in our discussion. And now, how double track policy looked like from the point of view of contemporary student. I just would like to ask Director Zorbas about the um, um, comments on how Ukraine was acknowledged. So how was it done? Because knowing the realities in the um, uh, Ministry of uh, uh, foreign affairs and what's going on in Belvedere, uh, how was it accepted? In the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the, it, they were not convinced that the Soviet Union will collapse. That is why um, all the time, uh, even after a Yanayev um, overthrow, um, according to this, um, it was supposed to be about a good relationship, um, neighbor relationship uh, between Obviously, you can check everything uh, in archive uh, after 30 years, uh, uh, memory fails. Uh, it was supposed to be a standard treaty um, between the countries uh, about good relationships. And I was convinced that um, uh, USSR will collapse um, at that point. And then previously, I was thinking about some kind of form of um, renewal using some army or special services. Um, so it was compromised during Yanayev uh, Putsch. Um, so when we had referendum, uh, which uh, in Ukraine to approve uh, the independence, 
we have to remember that in August uh, 1991, the Ukraine has not announced uh, uh, independence, but conditionally um, uh, announced, providing that on the 1st of December, this independence will be approved in um, direct referendum. I um, 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 proposed to young Krzysztof Bielecki, Prime Minister, for Poland to change the tone of our relationship, making such an independent movement within our relationship with Ukraine uh, to be the first state in the world to acknowledge uh, uh, independence of Ukraine. The Prime Minister agreed to this. I know that there was a short discussion and nobody convinced the Prime Minister to do otherwise on the uh, committee meeting. Uh, the um, This is the structure that does not exist. Um, um, it was executed. Uh, Poland, uh, mm, the, there was the information issued by the Polish government, uh, which was sent out to the uh, world uh, from the 1st to the 2nd December, when the referendum results um, were um, announced. But clearly, it was uh, in favor of uh, um, independence uh, of um, Ukraine. Uh, Prime Minister um, didn't play any role in this decision. President didn't have the right to uh, run foreign policy um, at that uh, time and at uh, today, uh, which are vested into the government, so the uh, Council of Ministers. So, and the president of the Council of Ministers is leading this work. And it was the decision of the prime minister, and the presidium couldn't uh, uh, revoke him. So, the whole Council of Ministers could um, be against it, but they didn't, uh, it was not on the agenda. They didn't talk about about it. Polish decision was not absolutely clear because uh, many foreign uh, Western countries hesitated, including uh, USA. And I just would like to add that here from the Americans, we received very moderate support, and it was very often they uh, disturbed uh, both Poland and other countries of the Central and Eastern Europe because as the top uh, management of the Polish um, um, uh, um, uh, the, the top, ma top management of the Polish Foreign uh, Affairs Ministry thought that the Soviet Union will play a major role. Um, so here I just would like to refer to my talk to from uh, 1989 with uh, Condoleezza Rice, uh, the former um, state secretary, um, uh, who was the director uh, for Eastern Europe in the National uh, Security Board. Um, I asked her in spring uh, 1989 uh, in Washington in her cabinet uh, uh, with uh, the presence at the presence of Zbyszek Jan uh, where we had the mission together. What is the policy of the USA towards uh, Central and Eastern Europe? And she said, uh, we work on that. Thank you. Well, I would like to continue. Let me put it this way, as a young student uh, who is uh, on the 19th of um, um, June, I um, defended my master thesis. I was so fascinated by things on the um, in the EU East um, um, than my all scientific uh, life uh, I spent uh, on uh, East. And this is what I've been dealing with uh, for 30 years as a hobby, because obviously uh, maybe I am not the scientist in this respect, but this is my passion. So uh, I start my days uh, following information from the East. And this is due to the very simple reason, because I thought and I still think that what's going on in the East uh, has got a very big influence over what's going on in our country. And in the period uh, where um, our conference covers, it was indubitably 100% influence. I know that uh, with uh, many friends, uh, there was a f fully enthusiastic that Poland should uh, 
for Poland uh, to gain independence, uh, Soviet Union had to collapse. This was the absolutely necessary condition. Then it, uh, the structures of the uh, imperial, so the um, um, Warsaw Pact had to collapse. Um, and then leaving the um, um, uh, Soviet Union's uh, from army from the uh, Republic of Poland. Uh, so this was the question of the western borders of Poland. Uh, and um, uh, some people were um, delaying this because uh, um, decision makers were afraid not having the um, western borders um, um, stiff. Um, um, the, the Russian army, Soviet army was the guarantor of the western border. Uh, border. So he, they, they said, okay, in case you have a trouble, we will come and uh, make you independent. I started the, my scientific work and I know that this enthusiasm was um, changed into concrete analysis. And let me put it this way, it was very fascinating because uh, nothing um, uh, makes uh, scientists work more than things uh, which happen here and now uh, to um, uh, put it in a scientific uh, way because as a young scientist uh, it was not a big uh, work but since I uh, come from the East uh, and uh, I come from the um, uh, and I started in the East I think that my information about the Belarus and the Ukraine uh, is far uh, more uh, vested uh, um, than Paul from from the Central Europe, and this uh, mingling of cultures uh, gives better field for understanding uh, Russians and about Poland, uh, Russians and Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, uh, Dr. Barbara Jundokaliszewska, the floor is yours. So, in historiography of Lithuania, Poland is the 23rd uh, country that acknowledged uh, Lithuanian uh, independence. So definitely we should attach importance to the form of a narrative uh, of how we are presented. That has been mentioned today. So forging diplomatic relations between Poland and Lithuania happened on the 5th uh, September 1991. Uh, and uh, on the 4th September, Polish self governments in Lithuania uh, were dissolved, one uh, close to Lithuania. At the time, I was was a child. I was 11 years old. Uh, I will share my memories of that. Uh, so, I, in fact, I was in the very epicenter of the Polish-Lithuanian conflict, which was uh, presented as a um, conflict between uh, the Polish uh, nomenclature and uh, the Lithuanian independence aspirations. Until 1991, we didn't want to uh, recognize to, to acknowledge, I mean now the state, uh, the Polish state, uh, that that was the national conflict, which has been going on, in fact, until today. So its active actors are mainly the Polish minority in Lithuania and the Lithuanian majority. However, as previously, we had no strategy as to how to manage this activity of that community that was quite well organized, very much aware of the situation, although not unified, as we all know. But thanks to that, we managed to avoid the tragedy. However, until today, we have no idea, as, as the Polish state, on how we can influence uh, uh, the improvement of the situation. It means to me that uh, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs was uh, responsible for uh, Poles living in the East, uh, should take care of Polish people there. Uh, I mean, should uh, that uh, the Polish minister wants the international, let's say, community uh, to deal with these issues. But we know that uh, even now, um, the uh, minority rights are violated. That means that human rights are violated because minority rights are uh, human rights. And that was commissioner, of course, of OSCE also um, made some announcement on that. And the school, the Polish school, 
have been eliminated in some regions by the Lithuanian authorities. So yes, some actions should be taken here. Why these uh, conflicts now? Because of Gorbachev's uh, reform, uh, two languages were introduced. Well, what it meant that in the Soviet Union, national languages could be taught uh, again on the Lithuanian uh, community introduced Lithuanian into administration, but the problem became uh, the Polish language and the regions uh, where Poles lived. And remember uh, that various localities, like in Aishishki, uh, the Polish uh, minority uh, constituted even 90 percent. That that was a big number of people. So the Polish has been treated by uh, Lithuanian society as a form of uh, polonization of the Vilnius region again, which is understandable. On the one hand, Warsaw always claimed then that it would not demand uh, the return of the Vilnius region to Poland. And on the other hand, there was this Polish community which became more active because of these reforms. Even new movements like Saudis were uh, established on the initiative and with the consent of Moscow because uh, Moscow thought that um, these national movements would help implement reforms. And paradox paradoxically, national movements led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. But in this area, there was a, f a kind of a tension between Polish and Lithuanian interests. Let's, we, ha, we forget that in the 1990s, at the time, the, the then Soviet Union or the Kremlin tested the scenario that was that materialized then in 2014 in the Crimea. Paradoxically, even then, the, the engine for activating a Polish community in Lithuania to become autonomous was uh, the law on the Lithuanian national language, which was introduced in 1989. Then the first region started uh, uh, making declarations that they were national regions, let's say, with a national language. But at the beginning, uh, the, these uh, were to be territorial units, which were part of uh, Lithuania. And in Aishishki, for example, at the same uh, 200 Polish delegates uh, wanted to be an autonomous region, which was part of Lithuania. Only 17 people wanted to have it as an autonomous region in the USR, USR, U, USSR. So then autonomy seemed uh, to be just uh, a kind of uh, ersatz of independence, and Warsaw clearly declared that it would not demand uh, the return of Vilnius and this Polish community seeing that in a, that it was really difficult to introduce the Polish language and there was also kind of bashing um, in the press because this historical debate was really very difficult and uh, the, the soldiers of the home army and the uh, uh, pre-war history was uh, negated, there were some uh, acts of vandalism in Polish cemeteries, and they removed uh, the King Wolesław Jagiel's uh, plaque from the cathedral. There were many difficult uh, elements uh, that uh, uh, deteriorated the location. And the uh, peak of that it was on September 1991, where these local governments were dissolved, and um, the receivership was introduced, and this uh, commissioner uh, now even say how uh, the, the, these people were um, uh, uh, surveilled and uh, really uh, harassed and, and persecuted, and at the same time, privatization started. And in fact, the Polish community uh, was uh, prevented from being in power and uh, that the, some laws were introduced on, uh, let's say, the so-called transfer of land, so the formerly Lithuanian uh, citizens uh, could 
be somehow transferred into Poland. So even, well, these were very difficult uh, problems. At the, time, at the time, there were problems signing the declaration of 1992 and then signing the Polish-Lithuanian Treaty in 1994. Let's remember that the Polish-Lithuanian Treaty was the last treaty uh, that Poland signed with its uh, neighboring countries. Thank you, doctor, for uh, finalizing the second round of our today's discussion. Now we will have the third round of our discussion. It would be devoted to what has been said by doctor, maybe not so much, let's say, big policy, although, of course, it will uh, be here. But let's focus on Polish uh, people uh, abroad, it is the Polish diaspora that is called, but these people did not leave uh, Poland and became Polish diaspora like in the US. It was different situations. It was Poland that lost its land in the east and large Polish communities stayed there, especially in the Vilnius region and the Grodno region. And uh, close to Zhytomyr in Ukraine, these were uh, lands that Poland uh, had lost uh, um, many, many years before. So on the other hand, I would like to ask about the issues of the mentioned autonomy, not only close to Vilnius, but also close to Grodno, because there were rumors that Polish people uh, had a chance to uh, create their, let's so called, uh, uh, autonomic structure, and on the other hand, the rebirth and creation of Polish organizations ambassador. What would you say about it from your, let's say, diplomatic perspective? Well, I can't say anything about a specific situation in Lithuania and Belarus because I did not have so much uh, so many contacts there. I visited those countries from time to time, but I can say some something more general. Uh, I mean, as regards some Polish organizations that were is established in those countries where I worked. I mean, the first comment is that there are very few people in that generation speaking Polish. They were, uh, let's say, russified to a large extent, and despite great efforts of the Polish authorities that sent teachers there, some uh, Polish language courses were organized for the youth. Uh, generally, say, grandmothers uh, maintained uh, uh, the Polish language and Polish customs, so the majority of, of those people were pragmatic, that is, how to go to Poland, how to be able to deal with the formalities, how to send uh, children to summer or winter camps, and their activity was limited, in fact, to a kind of sort of folklore, I would say, form. Uh, so there were various uh, choirs, um, girls uh, dressed in folk uh, dresses, they were singing, etc. That was not very impressive. Although in Russia, uh, in, in the whole territory of Russia and to, to Vladivostok, etc., there are lots of such organizations, and we met uh, them in Moscow on a special occasion. So, for example, uh, the, the heads of these organizations uh, came to Moscow. They had one leader who had closer relations with Poland, and he spoke Polish well, but mostly these were ladies. And you felt that, in fact, their connection to, to Poland and Polish culture was not so strongly uh, present. We know the situation in Kazakhstan when there was an attempt, sorry, because we know that one million Germans left Kazakhstan and there were still about 100,000 uh, Polish people living there or maybe more. but. Uh, Poland somehow invited them to to Poland, and there were some actions made by some, uh, let's say, soloists who so arranged some kind of uh, surveys to be filled out by Polish people who, who um, had to answer whether they wanted to go back. And Poland did not create economic uh, incentives to 
come to, to make these people come back. There are no economic opportunities, jobs, etc. And some people who came here even left Poland later on. And so th that is one thing. And the other one is the church row. So there is a clear suggestion from Vatican that the mass should be held in Russian because it's a well-known, it was a well-known language because it was in Polish. Then people would not go to church, and but it was more important that Polish people took part in holy masses, even if they are in Russian then uh, focus on, on the Polish culture. So um, Professor Selmachowski protested against it. Uh, he was the head of the Senate. He didn't like that policy. But all these priests who worked in those countries had a clear instruction, and they uh, could not violate it. So once a week, uh, they could uh, say hold a holy mass in Polish, otherwise not. So that's, um, that's an issue and great infiltration by this community, by the Russian secret services. Even the Moscow, for example, there was a lady, I don't remember her name now. She was the head of, of this uh, Polish organization for the whole Russia. Uh, her uh, husband was the officer of the secret services, and he controlled that organization. Similar was also the situation in Moldova, where this Polish association uh, was the, broke up into several regional unions, and there was a fierce fight for uh, some grants from Poland for uh, being offered some uh, possibilities, opportunities to get back to Poland, etc. So the situation was really very much of, of concern and some activists uh, were sent also from Poland to, to those countries, I mean, teachers, organizers, or cultural events, and they were helped by, helped by Polish priests as well. But there were also organizations totally subdued to a former colonel who, I mean, I'm ashamed really to quote some things, really who sent uh, children to Poland, uh, two buses full of children, and he handed over to all these children uh, two bottles of, of vodka, he, which he took from these children when they came to Poland. So, well, these were very unpleasant. Uh, Events, Of course, as I say, there were also uh, very much involved activists who um, brought Polish language handbooks, who taught uh, the children Polish. So I don't know what the situation is like now because I don't work in the system. I don't know how the situation evolved and I don't know how these Polish communities are linked to, to Poland. Okay, thank you very much. Now I'd like to go um, to the, let's say, students' level, and I'd like to uh, ask Sławomir Veremiuk, uh, what about your interests that you had in the 1980s, I mean, the beginning? Uh, were they also related to the Polish minority in the East? N not really, no. Uh, yeah, if I have some knowledge uh, of that, that was uh, acquired, let's say, on the occasion of my interest in Eastern uh, aspects, because I lived 18 kilometers from the border, and I was interested in some family issues, because my family, after the 17th uh, September uh, 1939, uh, was uh, deported to Russia. So the older you get, the more interested in you are in your, let's say, room. And let me share one aspect with you. Dr. Rightly noticed that there were some uh, opportunities uh, to have an autonomous region close to Grodno. I think I don't think so, um, because in Belarus, uh, for example, the, the division uh, already took place in the 19th century. Whether it was right or not, I don't know, but maybe it was justified that uh, Polish people, these were the kind of rich people owners, whereas Belarusian uh, people, how I, I would, I mean, the native, let's say, uh, people living there, where there were representatives of uh, peasants, uh, serfs, later on, kind of free peasants. So 
the first blow Polish people encountered was after the January uprising in the 19th century. So they were displaced uh, because of the repression. And the second blow they faced was uh, after the 17th uh, uh, September 1939, so it's, it's difficult to say uh, now uh, who stayed there. And this dichotomy was used by communists, and they showed Polish people as evil. You know, the communists uh, fought against uh, uh, various um, owners of, of assets, etc. So uh, Polish people really uh, were so much encountered so much repression in, the, in Belarus. So it is now difficult to, to, to have an appropriate narrative. And as the moderator rightly pointed out, now, well, uh, these 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 Polish people living there are not Polish diaspora, but okay, locals living there forever. But there are not so many of them anymore. And yeah, I sometimes also read something on Poles living in the East, but it's not my scientific interest. And now, Doctor Barbara, tell me about what's happening in the Lithuania. Uh, Poland and uh, Belarus. So uh, 12 kilometers, for example, uh, from Aishishkin, we had a, a twin uh, town which was in Poland before the Second World, but it was very much Russified in 1990s because the key is, it has been uh, here for um, being uh, Let's say uh, Polish, etc., is uh, teacher teaching education schools, uh, teaching young people. I, as a scientist, I would not be afraid of Lithuanization. And now you know, uh, in, in Latvia, there won't be, for example, any schools uh, teaching minority languages. So the 30 years of this permanent Polish-Lithuanian conflict in Lithuania led to a situation that people who don't have such a strong identity from provinces become became Russians. And uh, because they don't want to become uh, Lithuanians, and I'm not uh, worried about uh, language Russification, Russification, but mental Russification, because then when you speak Russian, you read uh, Russian sources of information. And for 30 years, uh, many programs, Russian programs, uh, have been available. and. Uh, Polish community also used um, that, and now it's a well-known fact that a lot uh, of provinces are still under the influence of Putin's narrative, although officially Russian channels are blocked, but you must know that in various uh, provinces um, there are um, satellites and still these uh, uh, the, this content, which is very harmful and dangerous in uh, our conditions, reach uh, these people. Letting Now, getting back to the question about the 1990s, uh, please um, be aware that as from 11th March 1990 uh, until signing uh, the agreement that is um, December uh, 1991, and there was kind of double uh, government in uh, Lithuania, so both Soviet rules and the then created Lithuanian rules, and the Lithuania was not recognized by any state then that Poland uh, had this dual track policy that it uh, talked to Vilnius and Moscow and local Poles also adopted similar tactics. And I was, uh, when we try to understand them, the reality that they lived in, they, they being unable to reach uh, uh, agreement with Lithuanian authorities, I mean, be it communists, because the Supreme Council of Lithuania, after this March 1991, also. Uh, 
comprised people from the Lithuanian Communist Party. It was not delegalized. Uh, Brazauskas used to be uh, the secretary of that party, and later on he was the first uh, president of Lithuania. And of course, they divided into, let's say, good and bad communists. But that doesn't change the fact that um, the attitude of communists and uh, freedom movements, that is, Sayuris, on the Freedom League of Lithuania was the same uh, towards uh, Polish people. Uh, there was no division here. As for the Polish community, that was it was very much divided. divided. There were a lot of leaders. And as I mentioned before, because of, of that kind of division on pluralism, it was difficult to hold a dialogue with Warsaw and Vilnius. But because of, of that, uh, also KGB was unable to control all these uh, movements. And we find uh, a lot of uh, proof of that in, in documents. We see how the attitude of Kremlin to the autonomy idea changed. And at the beginning, they were afraid of that. They were afraid that the Polish minority living in Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine uh, that was quite a very complex community who decide to be united and separate. So towards the end of the 80s in Moscow, it was perceived as a threat. But after uh, 11th of March uh, 1990, when it turned out that in Belarus this uh, um, is uh, weaker, that in Ukraine there are no tendencies like that, at that time the Polish um, um, society was used to um, um, deteriorate Lithuanian uh, approach towards gaining independence. Well, I would like to continue um, what my um, what former speaker um, said. Um, just uh, willing to get uh, the rights. Um, um, which was gaining in autonomy because this phenomenon was known very well and well understood um, in the uh, USSR in the Soviet Union. There were a lot of um, autonomous um, administrational units in the, uh, the Soviet Union. So for many Poles um, uh, in Lithuania and Belarus, it was a natural choice, at least at the very beginning. Um, 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 until uh, the word autonomy was not um, a compromise. Um, um, but there was also the question of uh, politicians and secret service um, wanted to uh, get uh, very complex things um, when we talk about the developing territory. This is not just the question of Soviet Union, but it was the question of um, uh, states which were gaining independence, especially Lithuania and Belarus, less Ukraine, among other uh, things, because the, um, there were less Poles in Ukraine uh, than uh, in other countries, and uh, only in Zhytomyr area uh, there were more Poles. So it was far away from Polish border and on territories which belonged um, to the First Republic uh, of Poland, but not to the Second Republic of Poland. And uh, the program, uh, revisionary program, would be far more difficult to, ex to be executed and to um, convince anybody to such a program. And if you talk uh, about Vilnius or uh, Grodzinsk, Grodzinsk um, uh, so on the basis of very good uh, sources of information, information from people who were very on the top uh, uh, power, uh, that it was just one uh, level below President Wałęsa. There was a plan to change territories, so it was just the plan. Um, mm. 
um, in uh, when we talk about um, these two neighboring countries to create a new Polish state and then combine um, these uh, two um, Polish states as it was the union of the um, Germany. Um, so uh, this could be uh, the war. So either it was via Krem Kreml or KGB, or um, that is why there was the support for this plan. Why? Because mainly because Poland was perceived at that time as a leader of change in the external empire. empire. Uh, in the Warsaw Deal uh, and Council for Mutual Economic Assistance and uh, Lithuania as a leader of the change inside of the USSR, changes in the um, gaining to gain independence. What was the role of Lithuania? I understood when, after, when I traveled to uh, Vilnius, so it was they were printing uh, um, materials in many languages for many nations, uh, including Sahalin uh, um, um, Island uh, uh, people. So if in Kog Kovno they printed uh, um, secret materials, which was then transported 10,000 kilometers away to the east of uh, Russia. So I understood uh, what role Lithuania played, uh, uh, and obviously in Moscow, which was the capital of the USSR and then uh, making war between Poland and Lithuania uh, being inside and Poland being outside was the uh, biggest uh, success that could KGB get or the conservative uh, um, um, party in the USSR. This was the danger. And uh, the, the, we managed to prevent this danger to happen at the expense of uh, accusations uh, against Poland Polish governments um, uh, that um, or allegations uh, that the, Pol the needs of Poles were not appreciated. Um, but the next government, subsequent go governments, wanted to meet these needs by Europeanization. Um, uh, so other minorities in Poland and others. Um, um, it was quite effective, but not very uh, to the very end, and we do still have some problems, but alternative would be the Polish-Lithuanian war and uh, getting into some kind of uh, um, uh, Soviet uh, um, peacemaking uh, arms uh, and putting so-called order. Uh, there. What would it mean? Uh, if you look at today's Ukraine, you get the answer. What would be the result of that? Thank you very much for the um, summary, Mr. Director. But before we go to questions uh, from the audience, I would like to ask each of the panelists uh, um, uh, about short summary. Uh, as uh, Slavomir Vereniuk said, uh, how in this period that we talked about and in the contemporary times, uh, Pol Polish people are uh, perceived uh, in the East. Um, is this Sovietization effective? And then if you want to discourage uh, uh, this republic to like Poles, so um, is, are Poles uh, clearly negative in all the republics or not? I just would like to quote autopsy um, example. I am a guest into Lithuania for 20 years, Kovno, Vilnius, uh, and uh, Druskenniki for the last 10 years. I would like to show you some evolution when we talk about the Lithuanians towards Poles. Uh, when we um, um, I'm sorry, com coming to Lithuania for quite some time, uh, there was a problem, language problem. Uh, 
uh, Lithuanians force the uh, conversation in Russian or in um, uh, English. We knew that they would uh, know Polish. It was difficult to communicate. We went to uh, Druskenniki. Um, this was where uh, Marshal Piłsudski was uh, uh, resting. So, and in restaurants and in hotel and in aqua park, it was difficult to communicate in Polish, uh, and I was surprised by that. But the breakthrough was in 2014 and uh, Maidan in Ukraine. I was very surprised when in 15, 16, uh, I came there. The same people who were servicing us or who communicated with us, they admit that they were have Polish roots, well, grandmother, grandmother and uncle. Mm. They can speak Polish and not necessarily uh, think that Poles are enemies. I think this is an example of Sovietization. Uh, so when we talk about uh, um, that Soviets wanted to uh, put some distortion between Poles and uh, Lithuanians, but the threats of what happened in Ukraine in 2014 to 15, I think that now when I have an occasion uh, to go there uh, to Golder, we will be welcomed as ally uh, because the awareness of what can happen as a result, uh, this is not where the um, enemy was looked uh, uh, for. So as the PhD mentioned, there were Russian channels had the knowledge that in Vilnius uh, the Russians are uh, governing with Lithuanians in the surrounding of uh, Vilnius uh, uh, Poles, but the Russian television is still available and so on and so forth. How one enemy can unify and uh, if people uh, believe that the Pol Poland is the main enemy, we saw what happened in case of uh, the uh, minority rights, Polish minority rights, um, when we talk about education. So uh, that means that we were poorly identified. Uh, so they didn't, uh, redefinition has uh, happened in 2014, uh, 14, 15, and after 2022. I think nobody will have uh, any doubts that uh, the enemy is where it is, so in the East. And this is the first reflection. And it's, I like um, traveling uh, East, um, and I know that um, uh, I didn't go as far as Zhytomierz. Uh, I went to Stanisławów, uh, former Stanisławów. Uh, it was uh, due to Russification rather than to um, putting some uh, quarrels between Poland and Ukraine. Um, so, and here, this differentiating issue and this organization, disintegration, was about using voting uh, issue and so-called Bandera troops. Um, so, um, uh, in the recent months, we not necessarily put it in the, the right track. So, this is the invisible hand of the uh, labor. Um, um, I think that the Eastern policy, Poland uh, and Russians, and I do envy uh, the ambassador to spend uh, in uh, Moscow. I always drum dreamed about the Trans-Siberian Railway, but that was not uh, able to do that. And I think that uh, given geopolitical condition, it will not be possible. Um, so I hope um, uh, your dream will come true. Mr. Ambassador, uh, in the, um, um, how were Poles, Polish minority, how was Polish minority perceived in the places where you lived? The most uh, important factor, obviously, is uh, the Soviet Union and former Russia. So uh, the, um, mm, 
Russian approach towards Poles. During uh, Russian Empire, it was anti-Polish, uh, so Polish upri national uprisings were not well perceived, uh, and the Russian elites was very critical towards Poles as the ones uh, who are bullish, uh, too honorable, and um, uh, this was uh, some kind of uh, um, pattern to follow, but um, they didn't uh, do it. They are. They do not. Uh, they are not the nation which prizes the uh, freedom. And Poles is some kind of uh, um, uh, very um, boost, boasting um, about things. So even Dostoevsky thinks that Poles uh, are the um, something to follow. When he was uh, in Siberia, when he saw how Poles were uh, behaving, which was pride and honorable uh, he envied that but on the other hand uh, that this um, uh, being bullish and being too too proud was uh, very dominant in the Russian culture when we talk about approach towards Poles uh, so I would say that both Russian um, society was divided. Some of them didn't have any feeling towards Poles. Um, uh, so people who were not educated, who didn't, uh, who didn't come to Poland or abroad, for them it was uh, not important. But Russian intelligence and people who had some kind of aspirations were very happy to read Polish books. Um, they loved, um, for instance, Stanisław Lem, Polish writer, is a genius um, uh, in this area where we had a very big popularity of science fiction literature. I um, wrote, was in Moscow when Lem uh, worked, and I was there. There were uh, some poems to the. Um, um, I just wanted to say. I just would like to say that Polish popular science, Polish films, uh, um, for instance, Barbara Brylska um, is very well received uh, due to her participation in so-called Soviet comedy, famous Soviet comedy. I don't remember the title, uh, but uh, ah, Ironia um, Sudbe. Uh, this was the title. Uh, so Beata Tyszkiewicz, uh, who is regarded as the queen of the whole Slavonic um, nations due to her role and um, her beauty. So Russian women uh, always uh, subscribe to Polish uh, magazines uh, with some kind of uh, patterns to uh, tailor their um, clothes. So at this level of the high spirit culture and this um, existence culture, if you like, when we talk about other countries, uh, I would like to say that this is just duplication of the same uh, Soviet uh, pattern because uh, it influenced the, the um, attitudes uh, towards Poland. Started to change radically once Poland became the pattern to be followed. And it changed the approach to, towards Poles. And there was uh, the um, uh, in conviction that this is uh, the nation that can break stereotypes. Um, uh, in the West, Poles were thought of as being disorganized, not uh, hardworking, and so on. 
So here it turned out that they have to catch up with many things so to get uh, uh, the style that Poland proposed. Uh, so this uh, changed our perception uh, via our um, neighbors and other republics, uh, post-Soviet republics in the Central Asia and so on. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Ambassador and uh, Mr. Director. How does it look like from your perspective? This is a very wide um, area. I just would like to uh, talk about one element. So in the countries east of Poland, um, uh, which uh, are not uh, members of the uh, United Nations nor European Union, Poland is perceived as uh, by the inhabitants of these countries uh, they want to have the Soviet Union restituted uh, or the Russian Empire if you like. Poland is regarded as um, very uh, we um, smart uh, uh, people because they achieved everything that uh, was possible, uh, meaning guarantees of safety and security within United Nations, access to a big uh, space, common space, uh, economic and social space in the um, um, uh, European Union. Obviously, it does not concern all the countries uh, uh, who, which joined um, uh, UN and then EU. Um, I mean the Baltic states, but it concerns the rest of the states of the former Soviet Union. And this phenomenon is uh, um, uh, this uh, recognition is quite uh, uh, new when we talk about the Polish international um, abilities is uh, um, latest um, when we talk uh, about things from the 18th or 19th century or even going deeper but uh, this recognition can be easily lost if Poland was to uh, go quit from UN and EU, and this type of plans might exist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And finally, uh, Dr. Barbara Jondo Kaliszewska. Well, two weeks ago, I took students from the Łódź um, University, where I'm a lecturer in the International Studies Department, to the house of uh, Mitzke, Mackiewicz, that is the writer, and his uh, house is uh, close to Vilnius. And their observations were such that in Vilnius, they, were, they went everywhere. They went to you know, cafes and shops. That they were able to communicate in Polish. Most Lithuanians uh, spoke Polish, not everyone but most of them, but they didn't find a menu in Polish in any restaurant. Druskieniki is a kind of positive enclave, enclave because they mainly, they this town lives from Polish tourists. So, well, uh, the breakthrough happened uh, a dozen years ago, and we are uh, waiting for that in Vilnius because Polish is omnipresent. Not only that um, mainly tourists are Polish, but also half of Polish minority in Lithuania lives in uh, Vilnius. So we should uh, focus mainly on monitoring uh, current affairs. But uh, we know that this community is very well organized today, very active. And I'd like to uh, appreciate, for example, Polish authorities that managed three years ago uh, to um, uh, launch Polish TV in Lithuania, which is to be a kind of remedy against Russian propaganda, but it's not available everywhere. Its uh, range is limited, but that creates our uh, image as Polish people in Lithuania. The Lithuanian, uh, Lithuanian society 
perceives Poland uh, positively because of its achievements and also because uh, in Poland for many years now they go do shopping, they go on holiday because uh, the prices are different. And now on the 24th uh, February, what happened then and how the Polish uh, people open their uh, hearts to refugees from Ukraine also has impact on uh, perception of Polish people. And there are also Polish people living in Lithuania who know foreign languages, Russian to a large extent, Lithuanian. And they are kind of uh, liaison between refugees from Ukraine and, this, and society. And two years ago, uh, there was also a great wave of refugees uh, from Belarus uh, in Lithuania. So definitely this Polish community plays an important role because the Li Li Lithuanian and other Baltic uh, languages is a challenge uh, for people. We forget that uh, Polish pe people and Ukrainian people are able to communicate. Uh, but uh, the Lithuanian language is uh, not uh, 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 understandable for people uh, fleeing uh, Lukashenko regime uh, from Belarus, and because they are always pe people, these people very often are not well educated. They don't know English. So in this context. Oh, we, we should look like that at the Polish community, a minority in Lithuania. But nevertheless, we would like this Lithuanian experience to be transferred to Ukraine because after the war, the relations should be shaped a bit differently. It would be good that the Polish minority should be, let's say, in the spotlight in Warsaw. So thank you very much, uh, doctor. Now we have just five minutes uh, for Q&A. So maybe there are some questions from the floor. We have the mic uh, in the conference room. Jan Malicki now, director Jan Malicki. So at the beginning, I'd like to congratulate you on, on that. That has been. Uh, I didn't have enough time because even yesterday there was a very intense day, and I'm very happy to be here with you today. And this is fantastic, very interesting. Thank you so much. So I refused some other, uh, say, commitments for today to be here. So, well, I have so many long questions. It's. Uh, well, if I ask my question, it would mean that it will take a long time, really, I mean, this conference. Let me just maybe refer to some issues um, raised by uh, these great uh, speakers. It all started with a magazine, so I had some memories connected with it. New Coalition in 1986, uh, uh, Obus. These are the titles of, of, of those uh, periodics. That was. Uh, uh, I'm not prepared today, but next time I will come uh, with a map because on the cover of one of these magazines we drew a map on uh, how the post communist uh, camp would look in the future. I was not the author of that map, that was one of the colleagues who could draw well. But what was interesting here was that we uh, foresaw, as far as I remember, uh, the independence of Baltic states, Belarus and Ukraine, obviously, but we did not foresee the collapse of Yugoslavia. and. Uh, there were also uh, the two countries, that is the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And what was important was well, that we uh, foresaw an independent Tatar state in the Crimea Peninsula, and that was uh, the dream of ours at the time. So maybe when Ambassador comes back, I would refer to what to what he has said today. So several times um, the U.S. and its policy to this area has been mentioned. We remember uh, the so-called Kiev uh, chicken speech, and that uh, showed 
this concern, this anxiety, um, disorientation, and real fear of uh, America, of what would happen next. And I'd like to tell you that perhaps now after 32 years, or 31 years really, it is somehow easier now to assess different uh, events. At that time, uh, well, we really didn't know how it would all evolve. So today, when I'm 60, I looked at it more calmly, but uh, together with my friend Zorbas, we were able to to do things that we did because we are very young. And I would say we uh, this youth uh, was not uh, dominating over uh, cautious. I mean, I wouldn't do such things today. For example, I um, is, uh, led to the establishment of the Underground Institute of Eastern Europe because I thought that such institute could exist. And today, I know that it's not possible. The Underground Institute could not really function. But I didn't know that at the time. That's why it was established. As regards uh, the things that uh, Kostrzew Azorbas did, I mean, uh, if he did now what he had done, now he would be punished immediately. Uh, or he could be reprimanded given this kind of bureaucratic structure. Now, Jaruzelski has been mentioned today. I mean, the election of General Jaro Jaruzelski, it was not for superiors of Ambassador Ross or for me, for my generation or uh, emigrants. That was uh, deeply moving. We did not uh, uh, know what was going on on the margins, uh, uh, who talked to whom, who agreed with whom. We, we just learned it post factum. And it was shocking then. And I was frightened at the time whether we could, uh, let's say, withdraw from all these transformations. And let me remind everyone here that for um, immigrants, it was so shocking that the then president of Poland in exile, Kazimierz Sabat, when he uh, learned that General yeah, Jaruzelski was appointed president, was elected as president, died while waiting uh, for the bus at the bus stop in London. So that was so deeply moving. OK, I can see Ambassador Ross is back. So let me refer to what he has said. Yes, indeed, secret services uh, had some influence greater or smaller, they were trying to have to, to exert some in influence on Polish organizations in the East. Sometimes that was a key influence. Uh, sometimes uh, this person who was called Nomen Omen, uh, Piotr Romanov, and I forgot uh, his uh, wife's name. He was very, very nice, and he was head of the Polish uh, kind of umbrella organization, the whole territory of Russia, but that was how it all uh, uh, operated. See, the appeal mentioned by Mr. Ambassador was uh, called the message of the first assembly of the Solidarity Trade Union uh, to the peoples of Eastern Europe. And it started, we uh, trade unions from Poland uh, greet um, workers from, let's say, Albania and other countries and all the nations of the USSR. And the author of this mess message was not Janek Litynski. Unfortunately, he never claimed that, but it was Henryk Siciński, a delegate of solidarity of Wielkopolska uh, po from Ostrów Wielkopolska. Uh, the southern uh, Wielkopolska. What, what, why is this important? Henryk Sieczyński was the uh, son, great, great, great son of uh, the, his ancestor who first used Liberum Veto. And Henryk Sieczyński 
maybe that sounds funny today, um, he did it uh, all as part of his kind of expansion for his ancestor. He was a doctor, a pediatrician. And as regards this document, it was uh, uh, written by a lawyer, a defense lawyer from Ostrów Wielkopolski called Bogusław Śliwa. Well, he so they somehow worked on it with Jan Litynski, so hence we can mention his name right now. So one more thing, that the, uh, during the Solidarity Assembly in the end of uh, September, uh, people heard some rumors, some signals how this message was received in other communist countries and the Soviet Union, and that was disseminated quite quickly thanks to the free Europe Radio, Radio Svoboda, Vatican Radio, Madrid Radio, etc. All radios broadcasted, and as you know, uh, well, uh, it was possible somehow to, to listen to this message on the radio, and uh, well, there were the, the, the kind of freedom was so huge, kind of madness of freedom, that one of the letters was uh, read from a Romanian worker from uh, Cluj-Napoca. He was called uh, Filip Juriosz, and he wrote very uh, deeply moving things. And after reading that, this um, security services in Poland, uh, contacted uh, the Romanian Securitate, and uh, the letter was uh, transferred. And the following day, day Iuris was arrested. He was imprisoned, imprisoned for six years. He was beaten up. He uh, was starved. So that was re he was re uh, very severely persecuted. And well, I, I don't have m more time to say something more about it, but. Uh, what is also interesting uh, was said by Madame Barbara Yondo Kaliszewska when she mentioned uh, that area from the point of view of the Soviet Lithuanian Republic, the Soviet Belarusian Republic. I mean, in the historical sense, it's a divided Vilnius region. Well, as simple as that. And when we talk about these uh, towns and counties, the minority inhabited by Polish people, I forgot the name of such uh, a town, uh, which is now in uh, the Belarusian uh, Republic, not far from uh, Lithuania, where 97 percent in the last uh, census, uh, that was for Washington or something like that. 97% said they were Polish in the last census, although it was not the biggest percentage in the Soviet Union. Maybe even Dr. Kaliszewska doesn't know it, that it was not in her, let's say, territory. Uh, there were kind of record numbers of Polish people in the Soviet Union. Do you know where it was, actually? Does anyone know? in which town in the Soviet Union there was the highest percentage of Polish people in the last uh, census. Svoboda Rashku. It is that uh, Transnistria region, 91%. 91%. At the time, those people had enough courage to say they are Polish, and they still stick to the language, that the language uh, they speak. It's a kind of uh, Polish Slobodian uh, language. They uh, uh, still keep their culture and religion naturally. So, as the lady mentioned, Saudargas, Marek Bogdan Skaraciński, Saudargas, I mean, these um, people, and especially Saudargas, um, was given a powers to create a Lithuanian language uh, government in exile if Vilnius uh, was attacked. And he was in Poland, too, in the very beautiful spot that seemed in the past 
it comes uh, Napoleon's uh, in uh, at the outskirts of Warsaw. That's where his office was, and he worked from there. I mean, that's it as regards my uh, remarks, because the topic is really broad. So congratulations to you, and thank you so much. Thank you, Director. Any more questions? I will be brief. And first of all, uh, uh, Michał uh, um, a publicist and human rights uh, activist. So uh, I've been grateful for what you've been doing. Uh, your work is really excellent. And I hope that's not the last conference of mine and all the other institutions like Nowy Prometus that take part in this dialogue. I appreciate them. But let me focus on something. Mm, some historical uh, events, uh, and in the past, uh, recently archivists uh, dealt with, and now this is very active. I mean, this Lublin Triangle, uh, the joint battalion, uh, Intermarium, uh, that is uh, three C's initiatives, Bucharest Initiative, etc. So uh, the things that have been kind of um, curiosity for academics is becoming real. For example, Three C's Bank. And as regards your achievements, your work on what happened in the past, it is very important. You should not make mistakes. Because if the 1990s Lithuanians were not enthusiastic about Poland, uh, let's say, put it uh, delicately, that is also the lack of understanding that Poland did not occupy. The, the, the common state was created by mutual consent. Maybe that was forced as an ally against Teutonic Knights. But we have to explain it to them. And of course, Poland, as the biggest country in the region, must be very delicate, must somehow enforce equality, so Estonia and all the states should be treated equally, which was missing, especially in the First Republic, especially as regards Ukrainian. And now as regards Polish attack on Vilnius. And I mean, Vilnius was then inhabited by Polish people. I mean, we should explain such things uh, to people so they would not blame Polish for um, people for occupying them. I even uh, met uh, Latvians and Estonians who said that Lithuanians are uh, so crazy uh, about being anti-Polish. So. Uh, of course, they would like to uh, cooperate with any state, I mean, the US, Germany, whatsoever. But we, we have to explain to them that now we have to cooperate. We all cooperate on a voluntary basis. Of course, we are a bigger countries, bigger than the Baltic states and other countries in the region. And so we should be cautious as Poland in order to enforce equality. Of course, taking into account the potential of particular countries so that not to make uh, mistakes of Western Europe, which treats Eastern Europe in a worse way. That, that's why there are such things here. So we must be very cautious so that the history teaches us something, so that we should now um, create new structures of cooperation. It should be made in a kind of informed way uh, so that we should later on not be blamed for forcing them. They should know that they are their decisions as well as commitments to cooperation. So congratulations to you for the great job you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for your voice. And uh, because um, we are now uh, behind schedule, we are late. So please uh, hold further conditions on, uh, on the margins of the conference during the coffee break. So thank you for your presence and take your questions. And I'd like to thank panelists for their participation and see you at the next panel.
Hello, yeah, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. I can speak. Hello, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Galina Zelenko. I am from National Academy of Science of Ukraine. Now I live in Kyiv. Um, and I am a head of, of department. Dzień dobry państwu. Jestem szefem um, uh, of political and ethnic studies uh, in Kyiv. Uh, I, I, first of all, I, <laughs> I would like to uh, say many thanks uh, all Polish people and uh, Polish government uh, for supporting, for so important supporting of Ukraine in this hard situation. And uh, um, it's very, uh, I, I want to tell that it's very important for us. Thank you very much. Besides that, I'd, I would like to say many thanks to um, the organization, the organizers of this conference because um, th we have, um, good possibilities to, to speak about Russian military invasion against Ukraine, not war in Ukraine, soon and soon. Of course, the future of uh, post-Soviet area depends on the results of this Russian-Ukrainian war, and uh, then another war conflict, and another war uh, of this conflict in this area. So about the impact of the, these conflicts in uh, post-Soviet area. We will speak in this part of conference. And uh, as uh, we decided with the organizer, organizers of conference, we will uh, speak at this panel in Russian because it's more suitable for our colleague from post-Soviet countries. So uh, 
я дальше перехожу на русский язык, хотя, э, как шутят мои э, друзья и коллеги, что когда ты 9 месяцев... If somebody spends nine months uh, under bombing in Kiev or anywhere in Ukraine, uh, somehow you don't want to speak Russian. Obviously, uh, Russian is not a problem that people speak um, this language um, when you have some uh, psychological uh, problems. Anyway, in the 21st century, it's difficult to imagine that if you don't like the neighbor and you go into his backyard and demolish everything. Anyway, I would like to present to uh, the um, rep I would like to present the um, uh, participants of our roundtable. Maybe everybody can present themselves. Uh, Obviously, I can introduce myself, but as I can see, uh, maybe I will say it in Polish. Uh, uh, this is the University, Warsaw University, the study of the uh, uh, Center for Eastern European Study. Of, um, Dr. Uh, Armiev um, is mentioned, but since he couldn't uh, come, uh, I was asked to present the situation uh, of the uh, conflict uh, from the Azerbaijan perspective. So thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Vlado Vakura. I come from Uzbekistan. I was a member of uh, the last uh, parliament uh, during the time of Gorbachev. And I was also a member of the commission uh, investigation commission uh, when we talk about the state turnover and um, uh, the leader of the democratic movement Berlik um, in Ube Uzbekistan. I live in Sweden in emigration at the moment. Um, there is quite a lot happening in Uzbekistan. We can cooperate. I will try to come back to Uzbekistan. My name is Good morning. My Good afternoon. My name is uh, Mitaingan and uh, Gant Mikailan. I come from Armenia. Um, ladies uh, uh, and uh, dear colleagues. I'm sorry, there is one more participant online, our colleague from Belarus. Good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Yeah. My name is Valer Karbalevich, and I am politologist from Belarus, and I cooperate with the um, uh, Radio Svoboda in Belarus and um, um, Radio Free Europe um, and um, thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, obvious that uh, there is war going on in my country and this war is obviously um, of uh, huge they mention there is Russian invas invasion. The situation is uh, very complicated. These are my um, impressions on the basis of um, uh, what has happened on the conference. Obviously, in order to understand what uh, Ukrainians feel today, one w would have to live in Ukraine for a few months and uh, uh, hear this uh, arms fire. Um, so um, I understand uh, uh, Ukrainians to understand Ukrainians uh, as we understand them would be impossible. But nevertheless, I got the impression when I uh, watch TV uh, every now and again, I am in various countries in Europe from the very beginning, um, and I got the impression um, 
I see that Ukraine has not collapsed. Uh, uh, it's uh, on the nine months since you get the um, uh, um, arms and you got uh, um, some territories. Uh, uh, obviously, it's true that Ukraine uh, is surviving, but uh, it's obvious that we don't know the result of this conflict. So uh, we cannot, we mustn't uh, close our eyes uh, to this uh, issue because the results. Um, Uh, if you allow uh, me, I would like to say what the war is from my point of view. Everybody remembers uh, Putin's um, uh, speech where he threw the glove to the West, uh, talking that Russia is humiliated. And um, you can see that Russia um, threw it away, that uh, this is lack of respect, and the whole story started uh, again. And um, we talk that this is alleged uh, uh, change of the game. And in, when in 2014, Maidan uh, event started, it was said that they were inspired. I um, participated in them. It was at the beginning of December, uh, starting from University of Shevchenko uh, uh, towards of the Maidan in the, of independence. Over one million people were there. So you cannot get uh, inspire people to to get this uh, mass process and once Yanukovych uh, escaped when we talked uh, about these processes uh, with colleagues from Ukraine uh, we talked uh, that these escape of Yanukovych was uh, advantageous to Russia and uh, because this is easier to install your um, in that, um, uh, government in uh, um, uh, Kiev. Nobody knows um, uh, um, that Yanukovych escaped uh, the, to Krim and then uh, to Russia uh, afterwards. So if we listen to, uh, so when we have quite strong uh, information campaign uh, and against um, West, the West and it is so that the um, uh, West will not fight for Eastern and Central and Eastern uh, European countries and that the uh, Europe will um, collapse and that the EU is um, wrong. This is the best example of integration, best in the world, and there has never been a better one. And um, putting this type of uh, information took place. So when we look at the analysis of the Institute uh, of the Foreign Institute, the uh, White House Club, in order to makes given um, uh, the scientific sense of this Russian idea, then these messages start to dominate. This is the uh, uh, Russian uh, bastion, Russian fortress. Uh, I've heard the director uh, of the discussion club uh, of, uh, who mentioned in Deutsche Welle that Ukraine, uh, this is the uh, tool to show the West, this is to change the rules of the game. And here you can see that all the money, uh, all the world is uh, uh, made in uh, Asia 
uh, that uh, Russia should switch into Russia. So Ukraine is the tool which will allow Russia you know, there are some um, uh, possibilities to put in, uh, in to put in pressure. Obviously, there is nuclear power, uh, nuclear weapon. Russia thinks in the uh, 19th century categories that uh, they have this post-Soviet territories or even wider. These arguments from the West point of view was supposed to be that we are the um, power. Um, and if Russia would um, uh, win, win the uh, war, uh, would break all the rules uh, created by democratic world, uh, civilized world, and then the world will be in chaos. What would be the consequences is difficult to say, but now nobody uh, will be able to sit aside. Why? Because Russia uh, put a lot uh, also due to the fact that we talk about Donbass and when Putin was asked questions uh, about the objectives of this uh, special military operations due to Donbass or Crimea, um, uh, Russia would not distort um, all the relationship all over the world. Uh, um, so the Russia came into G8 club, uh, G20 club, um, in spite of the lower GDP level. Uh, Russia was allowed to this due to its size. Uh, in fact, it, it uh, didn't got anything out of it. That's why it put uh, uh, quite a lot at stake in this game. And we will be reacting to it. And uh, what we will do will depend on what will happen. This is the question of the word uh, safety uh, system and how we will um, decide, what we will decide between ourselves. And I would like to say that uh, the result of um, Russian aggression against Ukraine will decide whether it will um, it, uh, decide about the future, including future uh, of the post-Soviet area. And that is why I would like to ask my colleagues within the round table to characterize their vision and present their vision um, connected with these conflicts on our continent in the first part of our panel. Thank you very much for your introduction. Thank you very much for information concerning uh, the situation in Ukraine. And I will talk about the conflict between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. And as I understand it, um, and um, what was the influence of this conflict uh, on development uh, of the situation in Azerbaijan? Azerbaijan was the first republic, um, was the first um, uh, republic which um, uh, we talked about the refugees. Uh, so when we had the Azerbaijan, uh, the Azerbaijan people who had to live in Azerbaijan, the next um, events show how this conflict um, uh, is going on in Ukraine. So this is separatism. The first um, 
separatist uh, approach was to get um, when we had in 88 um, uh, in an Armenia um, um, and uh, the Karabakh to get the uh, Armenia for the connection. So I just would like to say that the first thing that uh, the uh, Soviet uh, Azerbaijan um, got this was the trial of annexion of its uh, territories, which, as we know, later it turned to be uh, the uh, war conflict which resulted in Unfortunately, leaving of uh, Ormans, uh, um, leaving uh, Azerbaijan territory. I was born in Baku, and I remember very well the, in Baku there was a, quite a lot of Ormen uh, people, but there was exodus of Azerbaijan uh, people from um, Armenia, but there was the uh, ethnic. Um, um porch um uh, from um uh, karabaku um so what does it mean for the state uh, the 90s um the collapse of the soviet union when the planned economy collapsed and all the Russian republics uh, had economic problems, uh, we see about one million refugees uh, and repatriates. Um, um, then it was uh, uh, the Russian Republic, and from 91, independent Azerbaijan was not prepared economically for this situation. Today, you look at Azerbaijan from the perspective of of um, the country. Um, this is the um, uh, NAFTA um, uh, and oil um, deposits. So I talk about a very difficult uh, situation, and I see that it also influenced internal uh, policy of Azerbaijan. Uh, what I observe in media today, what happens in Armenia, um, I was teenager, a teenager at those days, but this atmosphere um, reminds me what happened in the 90s in Azerbaijan, this is a frustration, displeasing with power. So this is just the lack of peace. So this situation influenced um, and obviously the um, economic situation. Uh, so just uh, looking at uh, the um, Azerbaijan as the country um, this is also very important, not only in Poland. I, I didn't meet with this in any media. Nobody realizes that Azerbaijan as a country from the beginning of uh, um, existence try, uh, fights for its statehood. So they have to prove their um, uh, borders. So obviously, there is a need to talk uh, about this conflict because otherwise you cannot uh, feel. So um, um, before talking about it, uh, you can talk about this uh, territorial integrity of both parties. So you have to talk about it. So from the very beginning, of the first day, Azerbaijan, in spite of being recognized in uh, their uh, borders, um, they have to fight for these borders. This is a very important uh, factor. Uh, what were the economic um, uh, results? So um, a lot after this conflict, quite a lot of money is spent on um, uh, arms. So definitely this conflict had such uh, consequences um, on the feeling of security. So first, we see it in the state budget. And the second issue is on the societal aspect. I mean, the cultural memory has changed. Let me explain what I mean. So when we look at the history generally of uh, Muslim population, I mean, be it Azeri or uh, Kur Kurdistan, because um, Kurds were also present in um, the Caucasus uh, region. Uh, so this 
cultural memory has never focused on national antagonism. So, and, and please uh, bear in mind that 90% of Azeris are Muslims, and uh, among them, 80, over 80% 80 are uh, Shiite uh, Muslims. So, what I want to say is that there was a kind of cult of martyrs. Uh, these were martyrs uh, from the Prophet's uh, family. So, this uh, martyrdom focused on Muslim martyrs. There was uh, no sort of discourse uh, of the nas nationalistic uh, character in memory, but it changed after that conflict. So after the war in Karabakh, um, martyrs uh, appeared, and that led to the consolidation of the ethno ethnical and political nature. So, well, let me just uh, mention one more issue that is prior to the conflict, there was a very a strong regional um, identity. So the second conflict, or let's call it um, war, Karabakh uh, war. So it is called kind of um, fatherland's um, war. So the, war, the, the authorities wanted to show that it does not pertain to ethnically our uh, uh, nationalities, I mean, but all nationalities, uh, Avars, uh, Azeris and others living there. So the war really strengthened this um, state and nationalist uh, awareness. Maybe maybe it's now uh, too fresh to say that maybe after so many years, analysts will assess the fact. Um, um, but another factor which had a negative impact on uh, shaping, let's say, uh, the, the philosophy of cooperation in the region, unfortunately, I say, because it has consolidated like that. It would be difficult to change it completely because there were some uh, roads, uh, shipments uh, uh, during the Soviet Union times because you know that, of course, Moscow made decisions for the two nations and, and the party leaders had to subdue to that. And now the states are independent and they may decide about uh, regional cooperation. And in my opinion, that is the only alternative given uh, the, the situation uh, as also described by a professor, because let's not have any illusions, uh, Russia, uh, I'm sorry to my colleague from Armenia, seems um, to treat instrument in, uh, its ally in an instrumental way. So the only way out for the Caucasian uh, nations is regional cooperation, which might start from economic cooperation. But the question is how? Because there are some uh, transport routes, some uh, shipment routes, because I've already said that the Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan, when it was established, it had already to fight for its territory uh, to somehow prove that these borders were right. And uh, well, there were some passages through Georgia then, and there were some energy uh, projects um, established then from which uh, uh, Armenia was excluded, and that would have negative consequences for Armenian economy. And there may be also some other, of course, uh, consequences. Let me also um, emphasize one more thing, and I've been thinking about it for quite a long time. In Russian, it's just going to uh, some kind of uh, attitude to neighbors, and I don't mean here Armenia. Great uh, losses uh, were also borne by Iran due to the conflict. As I've said, 80% of Azeris are Shiite Muslims, and it was quite easy. It was uh, it was easy to fight for these, let's say, uh, souls um, by Iran, and they were doing it. They opened many schools and institutions in uh, Azerbaijan. So the Iran was trying to actively penetrate this region. So, well, Shiite Muslims, as I said, emphasize this martyr, martyrdom, Shiite uh, martyrdom, and people could really sit listening to what uh, the um, say priests from Iran said. But the Karabakh conflict showed the hierarchy of values. And the fact that the, the role of Iran in, in the region was such that 
I mean, it was quite unique uh, for uh, Azerbaijan, and now it's negatively assessed. But therefore, uh, in my opinion, Iran lost this region as the sphere of its influence. It would be difficult to, to be there again for Iran. And uh, the second, I mean, in the future, I gave a question mark. I don't know, because the, it would have also consequences for internal uh, Iranian policy uh, with regard uh, to uh, Azeri uh, minority because that would happen in the first time. It was not like that uh, uh, before. We were watching some films where Azeri uh, military got to, to the uh, territory of Jabril occupied earlier. So we saw it, w w what the film shows on YouTube. I wasn't there personally. But on the other hand, the I Iranis were uh, shouting Azerbaijan. Uh, they were welcoming those. That's a phenomenon that I assess favorably for Azerbaijan, despite the whole wave of refugees. And, but as I say, uh, as regards uh, history, it, it would have even more impact on the feeling of uh, uh, national integration. That's it from me. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. And in connection uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, there were many conflicts in this territory. And um, generally, uh, even during the existence of the Soviet Union, a lot of uh, sort of states were created and uh, artificial borders were created. Somehow, uh, they are on their own decision, as how they understood. They created states. They arranged borders from Moscow. They were just looking at it from Moscow. Oh, we would do it like that. So we know that creating the state borders during the Soviet Union times took place based on the idea divide and rule. And it was really difficult uh, to have such a situation uh, in which conflicts would not uh, appear. And I myself uh, saw it uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. I uh, participated in the kind of reconciliation uh, actions uh, during um, the conflicts in my region. And I saw the results of, of these regions were a civilian uh, population who lived peacefully uh, before started um, burning their houses, killing their uh, children. I mean, the, the one nation of the other nation's children killed. And that all happened after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the fact that these uh, borders were artificial of, of these states uh, contributed to that, uh, and I'm now convinced that when the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union collapsed, the international community uh, uh, very uh, quickly recognized um, the borders of new states. If they could have foreseen uh, the consequences of uh, these. Uh, national and ethnical uh, problems, I mean, problems related to the borders, maybe then the United Nations and other international organizations, before um, recognizing new states and their borders, could have uh, um, worked on it, uh, like arranging new borders that would help new newly created uh, states uh, to develop peacefully. And as for Central Asia, we've seen some bloody conflicts in that area between Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. Now we have conflicts, an armed conflict between Kyrgyzstan and uh, Tajikistan and inside Uzbekistan in the summer this year. There was some kind of armed uh, clashes, Karabakhstan as well. This is the Autonomous Republic, which is part of uh, Uzbekistan. There was an insurgency on the part of the population. And the authorities uh, really, in a brutal uh, way, um, 
the solved that conflict. So this uh, ethnical conflict uh, still exists, and uh, well, they are still burning like fire, or um, uh, they are sort of uh, still uh, are uh, boiling and will uh, erupt soon. So it will. We will need time to. Uh, regulate that to um, introduce peace in these territories and so that the peace uh, uh, process starts there. Why am I uh, talking about it? Because I'm sure that resulting from a barbarian, barbarous uh, Putin's uh, war against Ukraine uh, started on the 21st uh, February this year. Russia will face the same fate as that of the Soviet Union. And the international community should draw conclusions from the collapse of the Soviet Union while um, approaching the future collapse of Russia. The things that would uh, be created or states on, on the, let's say, uh, debris of, of Russia should not be a threat to uh, security and that after uh, the Russia collapse uh, and the new states, uh, are established, uh, the foreign, international uh, community should do everything cautiously so that to prevent any conflicts in the territory of Russia. So I think that uh, there are conflicts in Central Asia and they will uh, continue to, to exist there because a gr huge role in it uh, is played by Russia itself. When the Soviet Union collapsed, the international community immediately recognized all these states and left them alone. And that's why somehow they transferred to the fate of these states to the hands of Russia. And Russia, without any barriers, interfered with the policy and life of these states uh, while um, strengthening uh, the existing conflicts and breaking out the new conflicts and the role of Russia uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, still exists. Uh, um, and I do hope that uh, the um, loss of, of Russia in the war against uh, Ukraine uh, will uh, be such that the, the role of Russia would not be so huge in uh, creating conflicts in, in these regions. I mean, that would be the end of these conflicts. And the main cause of these ethnic and national conflicts is a different one, and it's still be there and uh, Central Asia may become one of the biggest um, uh, uh, breakouts of conflicts, of international conflicts. Uh, that's why the international community should be prepared uh, for that. But this uh, community has already experience in solving such uh, conflicts. For example, I live in uh, Sweden and um, very often I do research into Swedish experience or uh, Swedish-Finnish relations, for example, and the islands which are not part of Sweden. And, um, and Swedes live there in majority, but these uh, islands are part of Finland now. So, and Russia interfered several times into such wars before. I mean, there was conflict between Sweden and Finland, and Russia interfered in it. But finally, uh, they uh, found a way for Holland, that is for this region, uh, to flourish. And everyone is uh, satisfied. Uh, I mean, the population there and the states and the economic development index is uh, one of the highest in the world one in that region as regards the conflict in Azerbaijan and Gorny Karabakh. Uh, I mean, a lot has been said about it, and I now think that uh, that in Armenia at present, in the region of Central Asia and Caucasus, Caucasus the only democratically elected president is president of Armenia. 
Pashinyan. He's a very talented man, and uh, he has a chance uh, to make a historical uh, step to solve the conflict. I wrote about it a lot, and uh, the solution of this problem of, of this island, uh, that is the islands between Sweden and Finland, could be one of uh, the examples that the pattern that could help um, uh, Azerbaijan solve the problem of Gorny Karabakh. So I think that's it from me for the time being. Thank you so much. So, you know, it also seems to me that um, at currently there are no such uh, problems that could not be dissolved and uh, agree on that uh, solution. But when a third party interferes into our uh, problems, who is interested in the persistence of the conflict, then it's really very difficult to um, solve uh, such a conflict. And let me now give the floor uh, to uh, Grant Mikalian. Uh, shall I speak uh, English or Russian? It doesn't matter. All right, because my presentation is in English, I will speak Russian. I think it would be uh, comfortable for everyone. Uh, so first, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to this event and the uh, preceding uh, speakers. I made a lot of notes uh, of uh, what has been said that was of great interest to me. I'd like to thank uh, the colleague from Azerbaijan for a very good, uh, calm uh, speech. Although I don't agree with the context that you have just presented, but I would not go into argument with you about it. I will discuss another dimension. I would like to consider these uh, concepts uh, that I planned before. So now uh, that would mainly be an overview of the region. I mean, how the conflicts impacted the region and how it uh, had impact on how we perceive it. I mean here the region of South Caucasus. So as for the conflict and how it is perceived, we must realize several things. First, in the South Caucasian region, the states and nations perceive as enemies their neighbors in the region or at least uh, the states neighboring the region and not countries uh, which are located far away from them. So very often unification attempts are unsuccessful because the threat is perceived within the region. And what is also important is that external uh, players and relations uh, between them and do not uh, contribute to economic development, but uh, they uh, could even uh, strengthen the conflict. Most of the borders in the region are still closed, and the perception of the region as, as the region uh, should be given a question mark, because in various international classifications, it, treated, it is treated differently. But recently, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund treats it as part of uh, Asia instead of what was earlier treated as a southeastern part of Europe and the countries that are part of, of the region wanted it so much. But the very uh, term of the southeastern Caucasus was banned in the Russian Empire and it was called uh, Transcaucasia. So uh, this has a great uh, impact. I mean, this term terminology has a really uh, huge impact. Apart from that, um, solving the conflict, the question is of how it looks like uh, and how it is treated uh, as the uh, zero sum or below zero. <clears throat> 
So it's not the question of one winning or the other is uh, losing. Everybody is losing, but uh, other participant loses less and other more. But the um, um, for the conflict party, conflicted parties, the loss of uh, anybody um, is the value in itself. I will just uh, want to put in um, some things. The South Caucasian, there are a lot of differences uh, and variety of ethnic, linguistic, and religious um, uh, differences. If we talk about um, the context, the European um, uh, conflicts, uh, taking into account Russian context or Western and American context is very difficult to understand because in Europe there are two groups of languages and they cover uh, Europe, um, Western Europe. And in the South Caucasia, there are a few uh, language families and everything concerns culture and religion. Then the borders uh, were um, um, set uh, by the Bolsheviks uh, in uh, the 20s. And as it was said, the Vida and the Impera so um, the region was divided in such a way that it had to cause conflicts. And by doing this, it was cementing uh, Soviet Union. That is why uh, Guri um, Karabakh was within the uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, um, and uh, that is why you could uh, um, threat uh, Armenians with some wars from, from Azerbaijan. It didn't help to uh, solve um, um, the uh, save the Soviet Union in spite of the fact that uh, they were frightened in the 80s. There is also internal um, uh, conflict, uh, the internal um, uh, problems, um, uh, like um, uh, this is the map I created it a few years ago, and nothing has changed uh, in dark red. Uh, uh, the marked uh, borders uh, which are close at the moment and in um, P orange the ones which were closed in um, the 90s and in the 21st century. We understand that you cannot really cross the border anywhere. Only over the 200 kilometers you can encounter so, some closed border where you have um, um, automatic machine uh, automatic machines and uh, fire guns so this is just the um, design of black sea ring but this project failed because um, Uh, because then we have to solve the problems and then have the um, cooperation in economics. So then uh, that this project could be uh, executed, but it uh, had a lot of pot integration potential for the whole region. It was about the countries uh, which are um, bordering with the Black Sea. Uh, so you see in this chart the level of trust in other um, uh, neighbor to, to trust to neighbors. Uh, so here in Georgia, uh, seven point uh, 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 one point seven uh, to um, uh, Georgia, and here you see the percentage of trust in other nations. So here this you see that this is very low percentage. It looks very modest. 1.7% of uh, Georgians uh, regard Armenia as trustworthy. Uh, this is the maximum result. Please draw attention to the fact this illustration of the um, military spendings in the region in millions of dollars, uh, American dollars for 2014. You see that this um, increases uh, from 50 to 80 millions in the 2000s in the whole region. And the result, um, as you can see here, the conflicts have got internal basis. 
let's say, Abkhaz, uh, Abkhazia and uh, uh, Georgia conflict. Um, uh, Georgia and Abkhaz conflict. This is the consequence of the ethnic polity um, in um, uh, Georgia. The number of Abkhazi decreased a few times in these years, and it resulted in very big dissatisfaction of people from this nation. A few words about how this conflict uh, influenced uh, the society and internal conflicts. Democracy was the first uh, victims of this, and securization of the policy was uh, happening quite a lot, and internal enemies were uh, looked for. Um, you can see a lot of examples in contemporary policy in the region, ethnic um, uh, um, oppressions uh, in order to maintain stability and to um, assure uh, safety. There were some external influence from outside. There was some external influence from outside. So the question of the safety and the human rights, uh, the safety was always regarded as something more important, um, quite often in the places where it was not necessary. So uh, when we talk about the fight for security, we were talking about the way in such a way uh, that the human rights were broken. So when we talk about the identity, um, it was um, 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 created under the conflict. It, um, Azerbaijan, it, was, uh, it happened quite often. There are quite a lot of sociological examples. Um, what we have to draw attention to is that the elites in these countries uh, where you had a conflict, um, for instance, in Armenia, I can uh, talk about it, elites were created under the conflict. Influence of this conflict meant that people who went through the war, people who um, managed this, uh, turned out to uh, became came to power, and these changes in Armenia um, took place in 2018 when a president, uh, current president came into power in Georgia when it happened uh, in uh, 12, when the party of Saakashvili lost power and the new power <coughs> Uh, doesn't talk a lot about conflict um, that much in Azerbaijan. These changes hasn't happened uh, so far. Ha uh, haven't happened so far. And apart from that narration connected with the conflict, uh, not only was uh, subject to securitization, but all these uh, uh, conflicts um, were um, uh, looked um, at. Uh, and it was instrumentally treated. Um, uh, so uh, this was at the level of uh, the current policy and policy of conflict. Uh, since some things became uh, impossible to um, adopt, uh, I will not give you a con example. Um, the last war um, was uh, done with Armenia, and I would like to tell you why it happened. First, directly after uh, the 90s and the fact that the Armenia uh, won the war uh, meant that it was inadequately received. On the one hand, that the, uh, economic reforms and political reforms are absolutely necessary. And so-called Homo Sovieticus that we talked about yesterday came back to its position and it uh, very clearly influenced the power and politics. And apart from that, what I said before, the authoritarian tendencies were observed in all the um, uh, countries of the regions, maybe in post-Soviet uh, uh, countries, apart from maybe um, uh, Soviet ones. Um, but these uh, had the internal um, um, roots, and it was based on a cultural uh, inertia. 
but in um, Russia and other countries, it was about the um, coming back of the um, um, Russians to power. So when we talk about the international issues uh, from the political reasons, uh, um, this uh, was favoring uh, the territorial integrity, taking into account uh, the human rights and the right about uh, self um, um, deciding and um, wanting to get uh, this uh, uh, in Azerbaijan, there was mobilization. It was propelled by Turkey. And now we will uh, talk about economic context. Uh, as a um, uh, conflict, uh, GDP of Gr Gr Georgia and Armenia dropped down over 75%. So. Uh, it was without precedence, uh, ideal also with the economic history. And I can say that um, uh, Germany and Japan, uh, after the Second World War, had a less uh, drop of uh, uh, GDP um, the, um, than uh, Armenia and uh, Georgia. Um, uh, so after this post transformation, the GDP of uh, uh, South Caucasia diminished by 27% more than in the western part of CIS. Um, I mean, here Moldova, Ukraine, uh, Belarus. Uh, uh, this is the drop of this uh, GDP was 28% um, smaller, uh, which could this difference could be regarded as the um, price of the um, military conflict. And in that countries, it had uh, less influence. Obviously, this GDP drop, uh, uh, in, it is not just the question of the conflict, but also the whole uh, socialist system was uh, uh, in here uh, very important. And what was the influence? So here, the um, uh, yellow curve, uh, this is the uh, Turkey, um, and uh, red is uh, Armenia of GDP. Um, Mm, per capita was, uh, this is how it looked like, and after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Turkey uh, was um, the leading uh, country, and you can see great uh, drop of GDP in Armenia. So, um, uh, in some post-Soviet countries were not able to catch up the level from 1998 in Armenia in 2017-18. Uh, uh, Armenia, yes, in Moldova and Ukraine uh, hasn't reached that. Uh, uh, Azerbaijan probably managed to do that uh, thanks to the uh, oil. Um, so here, the black curve, uh, this is the oil um, uh, uh, thing, and uh, the green one is the GDP. But it is not only the oil, the question of oil. Um, so you can see the comparison of that in the um, that there is a different uh, growth um, in the eastern part. You cannot see this. Um, um, it was due to the fact. Uh, uh, in there were some positive elements which resulted from um, development motivation. Obviously, this motivation was not only positive one. If you look at the uh, history, it was uh, the question to um, uh, make some democratic changes and uh, have some economic ter transformation. So um, having this conflict or not losing this conflict could be the question of um, uh, at least um, um, maintaining what uh, we have. Um, we um, had uh, uh, some uh, visible effects. Uh, um, this is the illustration which shows 
comparison of the countries uh, taking into account economic reforms and according to the data from the European Bank for Development and Reconstruction. And here, uh, in comparison with uh, G GDP per capita, Armenia, uh, Georgia, who, which are close to one another, due to the uh, ish, the fact that uh, Georgia um, um, uh, are below the trend, Azerbaijan is above the trend line. We can see that depending on how reforms are introduced, the development uh, is important or less, more or less important. One and a half minute left. And here you can see increase um, uh, or economic increase of the region compared to the world. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot stop on this slide. And the last part uh, that um, will um, have a critical character from the external uh, perception of this um, conflict in the West. That is why I have to be serious about it. Unfortunately, there is not much said about it, especially uh, due to the fact that the, how these uh, uh, South Caucasia conflicts were received in the West, but also in the region. So first, from the uh, external part, uh, this region was perceived as the uh, conflict zone. It was uh, limited to some conflicts. Everybody is fighting against one another. So the only association is the region of war. Unfortunately, it seems that this is what uh, will happen to Ukraine for a long period of time. Apart from that, Azerbaijan uh, was breaking out of it because it had uh, some natural resources of oil and connections with Turkey, mm, uh, which were mis uh, misinterpreted as connection with the West. So there was the uh, Karabakh conflict as the conflict uh, between Russia and uh, um, the West. Azerbaijan was trying to present it this way. Anyway, at least uh, we could say that the Syrian uprisers, Turkey, Pakistan, this is the West, and here uh, we Israeli weapon, and this is also the West, and this is actually doubtful issue. So everything uh, worked uh, thanks to corruption, unofficial diplomacy, uh, lobbying. And why do I think that this is something that it um, uh, distorts the sense of this conflict? From the Cold War point of view, if you look at these um, issues, you cannot uh, avoid this incorrect understanding. So when we put everything in one line. So the question, uh, if, for instance, Russia was in the Armenian side, no, it's very often that uh, Russia supported Azerbaijan. It was often that um, uh, Azerbaijan had on its uh, uh, side the West. So when we take it into account, Turkey, yes. But if we talk about the uh, Germany, France, we would say not. What is shown in media is not necessarily true. Uh, correct, because everything concerns conflict in Georgia, because uh, between uh, Georgian, Abhazi, and so on. This is uh, not uh, the conflict between Russia and the West. Uh, and again, we have very big contradiction between the values and the interests. And we have to remember about it, because if we talk about the interests, uh, they are short term. And if we talk about uh, who is it uh, good for? As of today, this is also short term, but when we talk about the human rights and democracy, it is very important to take it into account when we talk about the conflict because it plays a big role and these issues are the source of conflicts. And if we ignore them, so either we create conditions to continue the conflict or to destroy these values, which later on uh, irrevocably um, has got its influence over this uh, country development. 
development. Here we can see many examples, like the example of Syria. I wouldn't go in depth into this particular issue, but we see that the priority related to the human rights will always lead to a greater tragedy in those regions where such policy is adopted. A lot has been said about the conflict in Georgia, uh, Russia's uh, attack uh, against Georgia uh, in 2008, which was compared to the situation in Ukraine now, but little was said about the fact that the conflict became to a large extent the reason for such motivation on the part of Russia that it may um, do such things and it will not bear any consequences. It may compare it to the situation where Hitler, before attacked, uh, he attacked Poland, he may, uh, made a relevant speech earlier. So thank you for, very much. And now, very often, we are trying uh, to present these conflicts as a way to, let me refer to why uh, we refer to these conflicts in the former post-Soviet area as um, the conflict between Russia and the West. Why? Because there is one big country and tens of smaller countries. There are borders between republics, between big which became the borders of particular uh, between particular states after the collapse of the Soviet Union. There is a treaty on cooperation. There is an agreement on demarcation acknowledgement of borders signed between Russia and other states. So why did uh, Russia come to the conclusion that it might use force? And why it may make demands on the countries and may uh, reject all these um, treaties. And why does it say that the West wants to take over Ukraine? Of course, there is a country which doesn't want to have anything to do with another country, but it is, let's say, attracted by more interesting economic uh, system. So it's normal that the country which was earlier part of a bigger country looks west, like Ukraine. This is absolutely normal. That's, I wouldn't say that it is the conflict between Russia and the West. No, it is Russia's aggressive policy uh, to its uh, neighboring countries to create uh, the area of influence in the region. Let me now give the floor to our colleague from Belarus. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Can you hear? Uh, yes, um, I can hear you, Mr. Karbalevich. Can you hear us? Okay. So, Mr. Um, Karbalevich, I'd like to give the floor to you. Uh, yes, thank you. So, all the consequences of the Soviet Union uh, collapse and uh, those of the conflicts that um, happened after that could not be discussed um, in a very short uh, period of time. That's why I will just say a few sentences. What is happening right now in the region of Eastern Europe, uh, I mean, in the post-Soviet uh, area, is um, the outcome of uh, the different assessment of uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. You can see that one nation assesses the collapse of the Soviet Union as a negative phenomenon, whether other countries, including Belarus, 
assess it positively. What is interesting is that uh, Putin, uh, before uh, starting the war in Ukraine, explain its policy uh, to towards Ukraine by saying that the collapse of the Soviet Union was unjust as uh, unjust was the establishment of the borders after uh, that collapse and that's why the R Russia has a full moral and political right to review these borders and now we are observing the consequences of such approach and the events that took place of this year and not only this year but also within the last two years show that the collapse of uh, the USSR, if we look at it uh, from the historical perspective, um, is not over yet. It's still ongoing. And it is not only the war in Ukraine which shows it, but also the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, the conflict in uh, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. And in my opinion, one of the consequences of the war against Ukraine would be further disintegration of the post-Soviet uh, area because there's such concept according to, to which Putin, while reviewing uh, the, the uh, results of the Soviet Union collapse, Inti intimidates uh, the, the states. He says that uh, what is happening now in Ukraine may also happen in another country. Uh, several words now about uh, Russia's war against Ukraine. I mean, in my opinion, regardless of how it ends, it will become a very strong catalyst for blocking uh, Russia's development. I mean, with regard to institutional development, uh, I mean, economic ties between Russia and the West were interrupted. Russia was, in fact, excluded uh, from uh, the international uh, economy. Uh, if Russia had wanted, resulting from, from the war, uh, to divide the world to its benefit, it didn't happen, just the opposite uh, happened. Obviously, International relations uh, are changing, and the position of Russia is also changing. And at the same time, at the same time, time uh, is against Russia because each day of war is a, a day uh, that is undermining its uh, previous uh, status. The war showed that it is not only in terms of economic, but also military aspects. It turned out that the, let's say, rumors about uh, the, say, spurious power of Russia are uh, hugely exaggerated. Now, a few words about Belarus. So based on the history of totalitarian regimes that existed in the region of the former the Soviet bloc or, or the bloc which was under the Soviet influence, the basis uh, for, uh, say, creating totalitarian regimes were uh, nationalist uh, movements. The communist ideology um, accepted that and uh, transformations uh, uh, went uh, into that direction in this area and in, in the region of uh, the former uh, socialist countries. And against this background, um, the uh, uh, Belarusian uh, uh, regime of Lukashenko 
is uh, very different uh, from that. What I mean is that um, the process that uh, took place in the, let's say, post-socialist area and the events that are taking place now in Belarus are completely different or very much different. Um, first and foremost, uh, the historical myths that are, let's say, the basis for uh, national awareness are to show that a particular state has very deep roots. Lukashenko, in fact, rejected the whole history of Belarus. And at the beginning of, let's say, creating uh, the nation, or the beginnings of, 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 of the nations, he considered to be uh, the beginning of uh, the Second World War, this kind of fatherland's war. All the other states uh, rather were in favor of breaking up ties with Russia, of uh, going further from Russia, and uh, breaking up with the heritage of, of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union Empire. So they um, focused on, on national uh, values. Lukashenko was trying to reverse it all. He wanted to create a kind of Russian-speaking nation. Also, to some extent, uh, connected with the Soviet mythology. So this kind of culture was somehow put aside. And generally, officially, in official circumstances, the historical discussion was uh, perceived as a kind of uh, great uh, failure and the, the, the very collapse of the Soviet Union was considered to be a failure and the creation of the independent Belarus is also something like that. You should draw attention to the fact that um, Belarusian uh, political regime uh, really um, is in uh, support or is in favor of, of the area of the former USSR. Therefore, in Belarus, to a large extent, uh, Soviet uh, attributes still exist, like the state flag and emblem. And anthem slightly changed uh, compared to uh, the one uh, sung in the Soviet Union uh, by um, the uh, Soviet um, Belarusian uh, Republic, so the names of streets and the monuments from the Soviet times uh, are still there. So Belarus is the only country that celebrates uh, the October Revolution, or uh, KGB still uh, keeps its former name, it, its name, where the all the time, this kind of Lenin's uh, cult is still present, and it would not be possible uh, without idealization of the Soviet history. That's why uh, Stalinism is considered as justified, and the victory day is celebrated practically in the same way, like in Russia, in a very pathetic and ceremonial way. So uh, in a very kind of uh, yeah, ceremonial way. And, and Lukashenko claims that thanks to that, Belarus uh, independence was uh, possible. And uh, the 3rd July is uh, the day of Belarus independence. That is a liberation of uh, Minsk uh, from Hitler's uh, fascists. So that was quite a far away a past as compared to uh, what Ukraine and other countries um, have, adop have adopted. And this picture, kind of joyful picture, was to a large extent drawn due to the events that took place 
in uh, 2020 because of, of the protests which took place then. That was a revolution which ended in failure. That was an attempt of change, uh, at changing uh, uh, the paradigm of Belarusian development, an attempt at uh, creating or building uh, the Belarusian nations based on its own culture. These were uh, protests uh, under white, red, white uh, flag. This is uh, the flag of uh, Lukashenko's opponents. That is the flag that symbolizes uh, um, the alternative model to that of, of the Soviet one, uh, to, to the Soviet one. So um, what is interesting is uh, that with such assessment was uh, given uh, with regard to the uh, 20, uh, 20 events in Belarus by uh, the British sociologist Lukash, we may say that was the last echo of the 1989 uh, revolution uh, that uh, put an end uh, to communist regimes. That was the last blow, and I guess it's even a quotation from that book that uh, that was the blow to the illusion created by uh, Lukashenko okay, that you can uh, ensure development while maintaining the key elements of the Soviet area. area. So Lukashenko, Lukashenko presented the alternative variant of the economic uh, of the democratic transformation but the most recent events uh, showed that uh, this uh, project failed and it seems to me that uh, the 2020 events uh, really uh, to a large extent defined uh, the fact that Lukashenko uh, supported uh, Russia in the war against uh, Ukraine. I mean, and that's why Rus Ru Russia supported him in 2020. And now uh, to show uh, his uh, gratefulness uh, as to Putin then uh, in this conflict, uh, uh, Russia's conflict uh, against um, Ukraine, uh, Russia, uh, I mean, Belarus supports Russia. So can I ask you a question? Can you logically somehow, uh, do you logically lead us to another part of our uh, discussion, uh, which is on how uh, the Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine or uh, how the creation of a very broad anti-Russian uh, coalition and all these horrible things that uh, took place during the war, uh, starting uh, from Bucha, uh, frankly speaking, my my friends, my acquaintances were killed there in Makarov, uh, near um, Makarov. So there are many people now who have uh, very uh, personal stories now, which are very sad. So please tell us how all these processes that accompany the uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine impact uh, Belarusian uh, uh, society. Because when it all happened, many colleagues of mine from Belarusian universities approached me. I mean, they wrote letters to me. They expressed their uh, support and sympathy for me. But at the same time, they wrote that they were afraid, and that's why they were um, canceling all, all this email correspondence. So what is your opinion? Will it all have uh, some uh, impact? So necess we must necessarily understand that in Belarus, all um, Russian federal TV channels are uh, available, and Belarusian uh, society, the public in Belarus, uh, is within um, the Russian um, area of information and alternative sources of information, kind of independent media, were removed. So all. Uh, 
media like that went abroad and if uh, someone uh, has a subscription, a mobile subscription for any non-state related medium, he is or she is imprisoned because all independent media in Belarus were uh, regarded as extremists. So, um, uh, the authorities know what uh, Belarus uh, and, um, viewers see. The um, approach to the war, here the bomb um, surveys are forbidden, public opinion surveys are um, forbidden. The online uh, research or telephone research show that the uh, approach towards war is as follows. Support of uh, for Russia and Ukraine, this is 50-50. Um, and when we talk about participation, of Belarus in the war, we can observe um, um, that uh, both uh, opponents and favorites of Lukashenko think that this is the um, foreign war. The Belarus society is very different from Russian society where most people support the war. And that is why Lukashenko, in any possible way, tries to escape from direct uh, uh, participation of Belarus in uh, the war, because he understands that this is a very unpopular idea. And this idea is not popular also in the um, uniform structures. And Lukashenko tries to convey to the people the idea that if Belarus joins the war and according to him, uh, Belarus does not participate in the war, it will, um, they do not participate only because uh, uh, me, meaning President Lukashenko, does not allow it. I am in favor of peace and I want you to stop the war uh, on the Russian conditions. And Since I am against the war, the uh, West should uh, pay uh, liquidating sanctions uh, against the Belarus. And this is the way how you can survive uh, because the war for Russia is not uh, done well and finishes badly. We talked that uh, the conflicts which are connected with uh, your countries seem to be to you mo more uh, tragic and threatening. But since taking into account what kind of steps were taken by the collective West and the world uh, taking the aggression of Russia against Ukraine, it is obvious that it is not just the regional um, war conflict, uh, military conflict, but this is the war between international war. And it has got uh, a very big importance for the whole world. And please tell us how these events around Russia, Russia calls it Ukrainian crisis and this is Russian crisis. How does it influence on the societies in your countries? Just a brief answer to this question, please. Thank you. We talk about the West. Um, uh, thank you to Mr. Mikhailian for his intervention and for his presentation.
But um, uh, I do not agree with one thesis as a person who's been living for 20 years in the West because the conflict, uh, uh, Gorni, Karabakh, um, um, uh, this is the only conflict where the um, um, France, uh, USA, and Russia were representatives of the Minsk group and they did everything not to do anything. And the second problem of Karabakh, uh, the war has uh, shown that the very active uh, telephone conversations with the Azerbaijan um, uh, was uh, carried by Russia and France. And this is quite clear because these countries, um, this is a very um, uh, strong Armenian lobby. So I see that the West uh, in Poland, um, uh, um, I um, haven't seen uh, the situation where this is uh, the West, uh, which is uh, in uh, Azerbaijan. So um, uh, the Armenia, which increases its presence. And when we talk about Turkey, Turkey, as you know, was uh, involved in uh, rhetorics and uh, you could see it uh, in the second word about Karabakh. Uh, he was an ally. Uh, each country chooses uh, their allies. So you can see what uh, are the borders or the neighbors of Azerbaijan. So they chose the one who was next door. So what I want to say that if during the period over 30 years, a co-chairman of the Minsk group would not give even one village in the occupied territory, would we would have a completely different uh, situation. When we talk about the values and human rights, I would uh, um, advice uh, to uh, choose the allies which uh, represent the human rights. So um, uh, I don't know how you look at the strategic partnership with Iran. Um, if I may, uh, I would like to advise to you that if some, if we demand something from somebody, we should uh, do it uh, ourselves. So thank you very much for your intervention. I just would like to say that there is action to each reaction. If we talk about the war in Ukraine, obviously it's got a colossal importance to the region and everybody understands this uh, even if they don't talk about it, even on official meetings because Russia starts to lose and we have new players in the region. Previously, nobody would even think that um, the Minister of Defense Israeli would meet the, the Minister of Defense of Azerbaijan. President of Turkey uh, will be uh, the guest uh, in the parade in Azerbaijan. You see uh, the changes in the situation um, uh, under the influence of this war. Uh, weakening of Russia has got obviously influence over the media. I'm not a politician, but I think that in the states where Russia is the guarantor of status quo. And it turns out that you can change the status quo uh, due to the change of the Russian position. Um, so I don't think that it will uh, happen so quickly because a very big instrument in Russian hands, this is a big diaspora of Azerbaijan in Russia and also presence in the industry connected with uh, production and transport of oil. After the second war, war uh, for Karabakh, uh, Russian uh, troops uh, were sent uh, to the territory uh, covered with the conflict in Azerbaijan. And there, 
condition is uh, directly connected with this conflict. Uh, the um, um, uh, victory of Ukraine, uh, maybe not directly, but uh, weakening uh, Russia will um, um, accelerate uh, the uh, victory of the whole anti-Russian bloc. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that this uh, Russian-Ukraine war, uh, this would be this uh, half uh, means would not be sufficient because it will freeze this conflict and it will be postponed for later, and uh, indirectly strengthens uh, Russia because the ideal situation would be to have full disintegration of Russia and um, creating uh, the uh, North uh, Euro-Asia. So um, the change, complete change of uh, uh, these processes, what will happen to Central Asia taking into account this history? Uh, when we talk about the Central uh, Asia and its uh, approach to um, aggressive war uh, to you against Ukraine, uh, the um, pro Russian television and propaganda is predominant in Central Asia. Huge um, number of uh, TE, uh, Russian uh, TV channels, uh, magazines, and uh, papers. And thanks to this, uh, Putin managed to achieve great influence to the on the societies of the Central Asia. Huge number of people love Putin, and this is connected only with the access to information. People who think in a democratic way, who have uh, access to alternative uh, um, sources of information via Twitter, YouTube, social media, these people completely support Ukraine's, uh, Ukraine and are convinced that Ukraine will win. We mentioned many times, and we um, brought up this problem many times. I made a presentation in the European Commission, in the European Parliament, that um, uh, via these sources of information, Putin gets the next nations and uh, changes them into their al allies. Ukrainian uh, TV channels should broadcast in Central Asia with uh, translation on subtitles in Russians. They do exist, but in a very limited uh, scale. We have to develop this because Putin, not only with weapon, but uh, uh, information war, gets uh, some uh, allies. It is more and more and people that uh, who see that Putin, when they say one thing in television, and when you have other things that um, within three days uh, um, he decided to change Kiev, and uh, you see that Russians are losing on the war in the war. The um, uh, ship, um, military ships uh, um, are sunk. Uh, the um, planes are shot down. People, um, more and more people understand that Putin is just a myth. Uh, he doesn't have the power that we see. And what's most important, in my opinion, is that uh, this lack of success of Putin in the war in Ukraine uh, made the leaders or influenced the leaders of the Central Asia countries because they supported uh, Putin and they believed in its power. And now, when they saw that Putin is not able to achieve anything because he is um, pushing, but he is a speck, he, they are panic um, and they just see what happened when uh, Putin loses because this is then chauvinist Russia 
will lose as well. And at that um, uh, place, we will have democratic uh, uh, process. And these processes will influence Central Asia. And these dictators who now um, uh, run the Central Asia after the um, uh, winning Ukraine winning in uh, Central Asia, they, these uh, dictators will uh, have uh, the uh, will fail as well. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mikhailian. Please uh, um, um, give us your speech, uh, who, uh, because you are professionally dealing with conflicts. What do you think? What uh, is this? How is the situation developed, and how a Russian-Ukrainian war influenced the processes in South Caucasia? When we talk about this influence of the war. Obviously, this is um, influencing very hard on this uh, regional context that was mentioned. I do agree with this qualification that was mentioned here that this is not a Ukrainian problem, problem of Ukraine, but problem of Russia. This is a problem of uh, Russian authorities who decided to test themselves and international system, and we see what's happening in this test. But most of all, it influences post-Soviet um, space. And that is why it influences, and let me say how it is perceived in the South Caucasia uh, areas about uh, Armenia, where I live. Um, many people uh, expected that Russian uh, will um, um, win. Uh, um, then this um, changed. Also under the policy that was run by Russia when we talk about the Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict and the last um, uh, research of the public opinion shows that um, most is against Russia and in favor of Ukraine. And these trends uh, are observed because first we see what's happening, secondly, our own context has got uh, is uh, is important. And thirdly, we don't think that Russia will win in this um, war. So, um, if um, this is something different that uh, Russia uh, mentioned, so um, I used to live in Georgia. And I can observe what's happening in this country. I think that in Georgia, first we will have consolidated acceptance of this uh, conflict. On the one hand, uh, authorities try not to interfere in with this, but from the humanitarian side, they help Ukrainian refugees, and they help and they don't disturb, so that the uh, Georgian um, um, volunteers go to uh, war. So, according to me, Azerbaijan, um, I can agree with what was said here, but maybe not to the very end. We just say that the West is not taking it back. I meant here that we try to present it how the West sees this. But in the West, most countries, this is how it is uh, uh, perceived. When we talk about Azerbaijan, it tries. And I think that this is a very good uh, diplomatic move of Aleyev in uh, relations with Russian authorities. They say that uh, Armenia looks at uh, uh, to the west, towards the west, so Azerbaijan will not uh, say that there will be anti-Russian um, um, blo
block will win that Azerbaijan uh, is a part of. The Azerbaijan wants to do it from the diplomacy point of view. This is a good uh, uh, thing. So we have to uh, understand it from the political point of view. But when we talk about the Azerbaijan authorities would want Ukraine to win to, so that this um, uh, Russian quota that is in Karabakh uh, at the moment and which is dependent on the situation which um, happens in Ukraine and from the very beginning of the war, um, 70 percent, if not 80 percent, uh, uh, it was decreased. In Karabakh, I mean this continent in Karabakh, the same uh, pertains to Syria and Tajikistan and other regions, except from Belarus. So uh, all the Russian contingents outside Russia's border decreased significantly due to the war. So. There are such expectations, but I see that Azeris um, authorities pursued such a policy so that not to lose in any case. I mean, as regards the authorities, I think they have no position on that at all. But they take small strategic steps so that not to uh, lose uh, on this war. So the, the countries that are, let's say, physically weak or are perceived like that. But why Azerbaijan is not perceived like that? It's because of uh, Turkey. Thank you so much. Uh, colleagues, please now uh, show me if someone would like to make a comment, to make a comment or um, to say something in general. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, the question is to the representative of the Central Asia. I understand that the the solution of the conflict between Sweden and uh, Finland uh, happened thanks uh, to the United Nations intervention. Could you explain how it all happened and how could you, let's say, compare it to the situation in Central Asia and uh, in uh, Caucasus region, uh, yes, indeed, myself, uh, I am a politician, not a scientist, but I, I did some research into that conflict. So during that uh, conflict uh, uh, for Alan's uh, islands, three countries took place, and it's Finland, Sweden, and Russia. After the collapse of the Russian Empire, the inhabitants of, of these islands, who were Swedes, wrote a letter to the king of Sweden so that to include them into Sweden. So uh, Sweden sent their troops and they wanted to organize the referendum on. Uh, uh, incorporating Alan's uh, islands uh, by Sweden, but uh, the League of Nations then intervened, and they made decision that uh, the Alan's um, uh, isles uh, should be given to Finland, so that Finland could also guarantee the Swedes uh, full management of these uh, islands, and that's why how the conflict uh, was resolved. And so far, uh, the islands, uh, islands are still part of Finland. The official language there is Swedish, and everything works fine there. Everything was uh, resolved. Although earlier they uh, had killed each other, they uh, used, they, they sh had shot, and the Finns burned uh, Swedes' uh, uh, houses and vice versa. Uh, they also hanged some people there. And I very often tell um, Turkmenistan, uh, Tajikistan, uh, um, and Uzbekistan that we have many enclaves in Central Asia, which are, let's say, separated uh, from uh, the continental uh, republic. And this Swedish experience might be useful also in the case of Armenia and Azerbaijan, because so far 
all the time. In the case of these conflicts, the umpire, the judge was Russian. It intervened. It gave uh, verdicts. And if we refuse its mediation, and we adopt um, the Western style of diplomatic uh, discussions, because Russia is trying uh, to show in each of the conflict to Azeris that uh, Armenians are the enemies and the en the to the uh, Armenians that Azeris are enemies, but uh, the Western diplomats. Um, are acting completely differently. They are doing their best so that the parties to the conflict see a human being in, in the other party. That's why I think that a Swedish experience, as well as that of the European Union, which created a kind of a commonwealth of, of states which used uh, to be enemies in the past, is an experience that should be used after the collapse of the Russia in the territory of Russia and Central Asia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia as well. So it would be very good if they uh, could really get acquainted with that uh, experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there are more questions. Please ask more questions. So I would have a question to uh, representatives of Armenia and Azerbaijan. I am a, a journalist of uh, Radio Svoboda at present, and I very often write articles about um, the, it. And sometimes you can really uh, have, um, you can be in get hanged, really, because uh, you very often have to explain various uh, things to the authorities of Armenia, Azerbaijan, and uh, Armenia says that there is no Nagorno Karabakh. Please explain to me uh, when Gorno Karabakh appeared, uh, how do you think it should be discussed and how all this should be uh, explained? Thank you so much. So your question is very interesting because I heard that that uh, some uh, the, the gentleman from Armenia mentioned uh, this uh, uh, Soviet heritage, uh, Homo Sovieticus heritage, and we say the same. Karabakh uh, existed as a region, but the very term Gorny Karabakh is the effect of uh, Sovietization in 1921. In, in, 20, in 21, in order to resolve the conflict. It was uh, considered as uh, Azerbaijan's uh, territory, and the very rule of uh, nation's independence was uh, resolved like that, because the right to uh, self-independence doesn't mean uh, the right to separation and uh, to, to what has already been discussed. Uh, that's why. Um, this Gornei Karabakh autonomous region was established. Before that, um, there had been no uh, Gornei Karabakh. There was just Karabakh. So my answer is that it was uh, um, classified like that in the Soviet times. And today, I can't imagine uh, Azerbaijan without it. And we can just guess that the conflict has not been resolved. And it's also a kind of defeat on the part of uh, Armenia. I mean, that uh, because it uh, ha has occupied uh, Azeri's territory, it did not find a solution. Although I know there were attempts in the, the history to agree to some forms of autonomy. Uh, the Armenian authorities, uh, which also were uh, subdued to the, let's say, uh, central authorities in Baku, also uh, local governments dealt with it. But it all appeared in the Soviet times, and Azerbaijan thinks that this concept is not the right one, that there is Karabakh, uh, where uh, Azeris um, uh, citizens of Armenian origin live. Are there any more questions? 
I have uh, two comments, maybe not uh, questions. Maybe these comments would lead uh, to more comments uh, from the panelists. The first comment is about whether Southern Caucasus is regarded as part of Europe. I mean, uh, one of the panelists mentioned that uh, recently the world um, financial institutions uh, reclassified Azerbaijan, uh, Armenia, and uh, Georgia. They brought it from Europe to Asia. But this is not so important. What is very important is the position of Europe as such, and this is uh, presented by the Council of Europe, an international organization whose members uh, are Armenia, Azerbaijan, and uh, Georgia. They still are there, and nobody uh, raises any doubts whether they uh, should be members of the Council of Europe. And this uh, testimony of being European is granted by the Council of Europe, or it refuses uh, such, let's say, European membership. The other comment is about conflicts, about borders uh, and territorial conflicts, and the fact that the borders were artificially established mainly personally by Stalin, as, uh, and then uh, the next um, Soviet Union authorities in Central Europe and Eastern Europe. and. Uh, the previous panel was um, devoted to that, at least partly. There was an awareness of the fact. For example, Poland lost half of its uh, territory from the uh, between war period, but it did not uh, attempt to recover any part of it, even the slightest uh, part of the territory in Poland. And in, uh, it, it was a well-known uh, fact. And, uh, in other countries of Central and European countries, they knew that uh, the part uh, w w of the territory which was called the western part of the uh, Commonwealth of Independent States, um, we knew that anyhow, we knew that uh, any territorial uh, uh, claims would mean uh, that it would lead to war. And finally, Russian peacekeeping f uh, uh, arms would, uh, arm would uh, uh, intervene, and that's why Poland uh, really uh, renounced its former territories, and other countries from that uh, part of Europe did it. So, although there are some uh, uh, aspirations, uh, territorial revisionism, especially in Hungary recently, where many politicians would like to recover part of Ukraine and uh, part of Slovakia and Romania and other uh, territories, but that will not win, definitely, because that's the position of the, of the minority, or just uh, this issue is raised by the authorities to neutralize extreme right opposition. In reality, uh, the borders are quite uh, fixed here, uh, not viable, although they were drawn by Stalin in uh, 1945. They say he did it personally. He personally drew uh, these borders on the map. So, but the alternative to uh, Stalin's uh, borders would be much worse. It would be a catastrophe and uh, um, the uh, really great uh, defeat. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Pavel Polski. I have an impression that all the participants of the today's discussion say that the role of Russia in the post-Soviet area is important, and everybody, I guess, would like uh, to lead to disintegration, weakening, and the, the best alternative collapse of Russia. And I don't know if we are ready for that. I mean, and the Western countries are not ready for that, America, Germany, or France. That's, that's my impression, at least. And now we will have again a chicken speech. Can I say two words now? It also seems to me that the West is not ready for that. It is a commonly known uh, answer. First of all, it is not ready for that due to the nuclear weapons that could be 
proliferated in various countries which could be disseminated there. But anyhow, if it doesn't happen, I mean, this potential threat would come to back to us all the time. So may, we in this region, uh, regardless of this horrible history, I mean, Poland, Ukraine, or Poland, Germany is horrible. To German, we somehow um, reach agreement, and not, we don't use any violence. I have a question: Is Armenia able to uh, agree on some aspect with Azerbaijan without using violence? Could they make friends with Georgia? Uh, can these uh, countries cooperate together to create a kind of local political and military? Commonwealth, or will Azerbaijan be able to pursue its own uh, policy, or will it be perceived as uh, partly uh, pursuing uh, Turkish policy? I mean, this is a question, a simple question. Can they somehow uh, reconcile and create a kind of political system? So please answer the question and the previous questions. So yes, as regards the last question, in fact, it also refers to some other questions. In fact, there was an active uh, process involving Armenia, and Armenia uh, has always been in favor of the variant for regulating the issue, which was raised by three, let's say, mediators, that is the US, France, and the UK. So Armenia was able to make some territorial concessions on condition that Azerbaijan will agrees to some solution of the conflict and division of uh, these uh, disputable territories into two parts. So one would be uh, Armenian and the second uh, Azerbaijanis, uh, Azeris, and all mediators were in favor of that. But Aliyev, the president then reversed it and now he's proud to, proud to say that he personally uh, broke these negotiations. So the problem is not uh, on in this respect. So, uh, so because Armenia is not a large country, it's not the, the party, the, the conflict is smaller in terms of military and economic terms. So please analyze this question. As regards the population, there is no, not even a single uh, Armenian. I mean, I don't want to go into depth into it. I don't want to add uh, emotional, let's say, aspects to this conflict. But if we discuss it in such a way, then we must take these aspects into account as well. I mean, if we say that in Karabakh, um, there are Azeris uh, citizens, it's not true. Nobody who would uh, has Azeri name would be able to do that, and there are many more such examples. Just to clarify it now, as for Central and Eastern Europe, in first of all, in Central and Eastern Europe, we have the Balkans uh, as well. So in the Balkans, the situation was completely different compared to that in Poland and other countries, because there there is a different uh, context. So what makes it uh, different compared to Central and Eastern Europe is that um, if I was uh, to to say it, and I want to make this comparison, but I thought that it's not nice to discuss it here in, in this land, but maybe maybe it's worthwhile to do it. Between the First and the Second World War, uh, there were uh, some specific borders uh, fixed, and the results of the First World War were, were, were uh, such that they led to creating national states uh, according to ethnical and demographic and sociological rules, because people will ask various questions, referenda will organize uh, asking people where they want to live, and that laid foundation for the future peaceful Europe. And the same pertained to some extent to Europe after the Second World War. Indeed, Poland lost a lot of uh, territories, but it also gained quite a lot of territory, territories. And now most uh, Polish people live in uh, Poland in, uh, in those uh, territories where, uh, which, which Poland uh, lost. Uh, the, 
not too many people live there. You may agree with or not. The same was for um, other countries, uh, Central European countries, except for the Balkans, where the situation was different and everything was painful there. But that all also uh, uh, relates to South Caucasia. But this example of Northern Europe and Central and Eastern Europe uh, should be taken into account. The conflicts are not forgotten, but they are being resolved. And the last issue, Karabakh, is a historical name which appeared in the 18th century before uh, there were different names of the region, like Absach, Hachen, Berikfansach, then an autonomous region of Karabakh, which was part of the his historical part of the former Karabakh inhabited by Armenians. And at the moment, uh, there is also a kind of uh, differentiation between uh, Karabakh. Uh, Armenians call it Karabakh, Azeris call it Absakh. And earlier, during the Soviet times, it was an acronym that was used for that. Before that, there were two names. That is, in the post-Soviet Armenian, Armenians found some names for uh, some uh, Azeri uh, places uh, inhib inhabited by uh, the Armenians. We can't hear the question. Why? Because this is the mountainous part uh, of Karabakh. Um, uh, Karabakh, this is a big territory, and uh, Mont, um, uh, Karabakh is um, a smaller part. I think, thank you very much. Um, um, just let me uh, say a few words as a summary. My summary is going to be quite trivial, banal, because the history um, um, the borders which were created between the new states and uh, post-Soviet uh, countries, this is something that we have to live with. And unfortunately, um, small countries in the South Caucasus, um, Moldova, less to the little extent um, Central Asian countries, became in a difficult situation. Um, and um, it's difficult to form a position which would be very concrete about Russia. It would be difficult to have their uh, power. Um, we can say that the whole hope is in Ukraine uh, because the history does not uh, represent uh, what uh, we have here. Um, so um, um, we have to say whether we are in the right um, uh, rules of the game.
Dobra. Dobry wieczór. Wy nas czujecie? Dobra. Szanowni Państwo, myślę, że... Ladies and gentlemen, I think we can start the last meeting concerns the Soviet Union uh, picture and its collapse in media and culture. I have the pleasure to present to you people uh, who are responsible for these uh, issues. Uh, um, Dr. Uh, Paulina Godleska from uh, uh, the University, Jagiellonian e University, monography uh, post Soviet uh, issues, uh, the trauma of Soviet Union in the after this in 1991. Uh, welcome. Uh, which was uh, issued by the university. Uh, uh, Tatiana Jarmuszczuk, uh, Radio Free Europe, um, uh, and Nastasia Jevremia. Uh, who uh, works in the team and is uh, going to present her thoughts, results of uh, her research. Uh, this is uh, the project is uh, still under the working title. So is Rushimi. This is um, uh, uh, this is uh, um, to the um, Russian autumn near Rushimi. Uh, so yes. The words this project concerns what happened in various parts of the uh, former Soviet Union uh, in the uh, republics and the um, autonomous uh, things, the thought of institutional thought and the uh, issues. Um, we would like to welcome you. And uh, we will have Alexander Zinkenhoff 
uh, from the public um, uh, broadcasting uh, company of Ukraine. Um, he had a presentation of the documentary Collapse of the um, uh, Soviet Union. And at the end of our meeting, we will have a pleasure to see the second, uh, seventh uh, episode of this documentary uh, by uh, Alexander Zinchenko. My name is Hubert Boschkevich, and I am from the Center for European Studies, uh, and I have a pleasure to moderate this meeting. Uh, we agreed um, that in this difficult situation where two panelists are um, in virtual uh, reality and only uh, one colleague is here. Uh, we have to start from Paulina Godlewska. Um, and um, the book can be read. Um, uh, so this um, book has got some kind of uh, um, time. Uh, you have about 20 minutes. So uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to tell you about the, um, the main topic is the um, uh, memory about the Soviet Union. I'm sorry, I can hear echo, um, echoing the voice, no. Um, maybe the distance between yourself and microphone, you're using the microphone in the computer, yes. And the quality is usually is uh, uh, not in line with the expectations of the audience. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't got um, any other microphone. So if you could speak slower and uh, louder, definitely microphone will uh, get it. I'm sorry, but thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I would like to start from the fact that uh, the opinion about the past Memory means both individual memory and uh, uh, collective memory. This is just commemorating. This is the uh, memory which is connected with ideology. You can talk about different types of ideology, about trauma as a part of some kind of memory, and about the policy of memory. And, uh, the question of uh, the memory after the collapse of the USSR, it was the question of opposition because most of the production of the film production, this is in line with the ideological demand, especially in the country where the authority is so strong when you talk about steering the culture, moderating the culture and the historical policy. And I um, <coughs> concentrated um, on the things which were not comfortable memory, if you like. The frame for the narration, for me, was the uh, um, question of Marie Ferre, uh, which uh, came to the conclusion that the understanding of the contemporary uh, culture, uh, it could be good when you talk about the memory of Stalinism. And uh, here, uh, this is how it functioned from Pierestroika uh, till the um, um, going into the Putin side. So the memory of the metamimia, this is the question of the whole USSR, but uh, uh, the Stalin terror and among others all the big uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the part of war um, 
Uh, which um, uh, um, uh, showed what it looks, uh, looks like. So the uh, Pierestroika was the first period of the memory of uh, Stalinism. So this is where it happened. Uh, then um, uh, this was the um, um, terror uh, films about the Stalin terror. There were uh, films which uh, stayed in on the shelves. Many the, the, in uh, 1988 there was memorial um, association which was created, which um, created um, uh, which um, commemorated the victims of the terror. So. Uh, where we had uh, um, this was the period uh, where the uh, society the Russian society has drawn in the memory of Stalinism uh, and it was retraumating so much that uh, it was extended it was uh, steered controlled from the top from 90 to 95 um, uh, so when there was the first uh, tenure of office of Boris Yeltsin there was a um, Turnout, as you saw, that uh, Boris Yeltsin um, um, uh, uh, objected to uh, these uh, um, <coughs> traditions of uh, um, Soviet Union. Uh, he was referring to the symbols, imperial symbols. It was in line with what Russian society wanted. They wanted to have the novelties. They wanted to leave. Uh, they wanted to be open to the past, not to the um, uh, future, and. To not with the trauma. Uh, so um, uh, it changed from the second tenure of office by uh, Yeltsin, and obviously it uh, changed after the second uh, part of the 2000. And uh, uh, USSR uh, became the um, 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 resource. So here we talked about uh, uh, the current uh, demand to create narration about the future. Uh, so um, it um, was turned into the nationalist uh, uh, policy so we could talk about amnesia. Uh, so what was uncomfortable was forgotten, what was needed uh, was uh, creating uh, the um, uh, um, picture of the future. So from the myths, um, events um, uh, the uh, most important functions was of the uh, Second World War the great uh, war of homeland and um, here the Stalin uh, um, as such depending on the um, uh, need uh, then the um, 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 uh, also the uh, sport achievements and there was a bottom up uh, um, nostalgia um, after the um, uh, USSR where there was stability as something uh, stability was uh, perceived as something uh, positive but then the um, uh, Stalin was this is the myth of the golden childhood so it was ordinary Stalinism so maybe this uh, the top uh, person was not the good uh, uh, unit, maybe the um, secret service which uh, made uh, some um, uh, were responsible for uh, terror, uh, but um, ordinary people lived uh, well, good lives, and they were um, uh, um, good. And Putin said that the collapse of the USSR, this is the biggest catastrophe of the 20th century, and his vision, uh, Stalin became the moderator and um, uh, the one who um, had the um, victory in the Second World War. Uh, so this is the, we can say that starting from the 2000, um, the Russia started to get ready for the war. The only positive myth was the victory myth. Um, maybe the myth of universe. 
Uh, so the, there was a myth of um, the memories which uh, um, uh, lo were killed in the Second World War. Um, from the 2015, this was the official commemorative uh, policy of the authorities. Obviously, there was the whole imperial uh, propaganda, uh, according to um, Crimea, and then there was the pacification of the free media, cinema and television, and it was uh, very visible for the period of the last two years, especially. And for the memory about this uh, USSR, there is no institutional um, uh, condemnation. Uh, we couldn't uh, have uh, the uh, questions, the lack of uh, uh, collective uh, commemorating forms. They are still individual ones and official historic policy. So we could talk about uh, uh, talking about difficult uh, situations in the uh, past. So as uh, in the family, if something is wrong, something is bad. Um, so the same strategy uh, could uh, talk about the um, uh, state. And it was also about uh, bringing up, you. obviously, the cinema was involved in it. Uh, uh, so the uh, cinema, which was uh, financed by the companies uh, related by the company. Uh, so this was the whole uh, opposition uh, cinema. Uh, so this is just the question of the difficult uh, past. Uh, um, and uh, the question of Pierre Stroika um, um, and uh, and uh, the, com uh, the 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 um, um, atonement uh, the uh, company um, this was uh, done so the second uh, um, thing was about Pierre Stroika in black uh, thoughts this is as the reaction because then the contemporary times was uh, interpreted as the result of existence of the Soviet Union as the uh, socialism arabur Uh, so when we talk about the location of tragic uh, um, uh, things, so uh, of individual uh, waves of uh, terror. So the first impulse didn't come from the inside, but from outside. Uh, uh, so um, everybody said that um, um, we had um, uh, everything which was uh, explaining the history of Russia. This was uh, concerning terror produced after the collapse of the USSR. The most imp interesting is the uh, Sergei Robeshkin directed film Czechist. Uh, it was the Vladimir Zazubrin. Uh, so here uh, we can say that this is a very low uh, documentary um, uh, uh, um, uh, work uh, in the um, period of the Red Terror. And this adaptation was based on the realistic uh, thing and it was just showing the crime issues uh, and giving the contemporary um, 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 interpretation. So it was uh, uh, gaining the question of religion and folk issues, um, which uh, would, did not exist uh, during the Bolshevik thing. So um, uh, when we talked about it, uh, this is a melodrama. Uh, so uh, everything which was done, uh, melodramatic things, and the uh, being muscularity was uh, um, the main things. This this is the uh, um, uh, happened after the French Revolution uh, that there are uh, values which may be vanished at this given point, uh, but um, uh, you can uh, see it and direct it. So this is something that uh, um, uh, gives the puts the word in order. So um, um, the burned by the sun, uh, directed by Michalkov, 
where here the line is not between the men, uh, male and female, but between the male. So, so looking for the ideal man, this is something uh, what is uh, done. So the question about Kotov and Giao, so who is the carrier of this uh, values? So, so this is the um, uh, value which is uh, done by the uh, hero. So. Um, so when we have the Soviet trauma, so this is the uh, generation uh, without uh, fathers. So when we looked at the fact that the um, um, people in Russia, were, or men in Russia, were arrested, so here we can say the thief Pavel, by Pavel Chukrai. And the most important thing here is that uh, his star of Samolod, um, Alexis Darshri, which is the perversal um, uh, fantasy, what would happen? Uh, if the uh, uh, father was arrested. It was very perversial with uh, a lot of sexual abuse, um, violence, um, uh, and it showed in a, a bad way. This is the, just the farewell to the Stalin area where the fear, um, disgust uh, was to rev um, uh, get away with this um, cult. And cult, uh, Mainly was the second um, um, area touched by the Russian um, uh, creators. Uh, for instance, a myth would be a new man. You is it, was it possible to create it? There is a great uh, the children of iron gods, uh, which happens in contemporary um, uh, thing, and as if the communism uh, won. Uh, so um, the new man um, uh, from before. For 1994, um, where the, uh, there is a change of sex, so the women uh, transfers into the men uh, can be a new, um, new, new, new human being. Uh, so this is uh, ex this was extreme uh, expression, and the final is quite subvert uh, because there is a question about how, uh, what was the ideal Soviet body. Uh, like was it the sporty uh, one with full muscles uh, um, or was it paralyzed uh, hero of the um, book uh, how iron got uh, hardened um, was it the uh, somebody in the army or a um, prisoner in uh, the um, uh, Wagner camp? The next myth, this is the war, and the um, uh, war uh, cinema is very popular. Uh, so here, this was about, the, there was the sequels or some paraphrases uh, of the Soviet scenarios and the par about, um, close to this blockbusters when we talk about the war we had some uh, films which were questioning the myth of um, um, victory. First, there was a film forward about the young say, ju ju juvenile uh, criminals. That was the kind of double vision, uh, vision of the Soviet uh, criminal battalion. Very interesting uh, film about collaboration. And the last train, that is the viewpoint of the German uh, doctor on the war on the Eastern far Front. So most of these uh, movies were propaganda uh, films like we are from the future, young boys that with hooligans are now soldiers in the front and because they travel in time and they grow up there, they become patriotic and when they get back to the present times, they could be the leaders of their peers. And traditional propaganda films from the 2000s, this is uh, the story of uh, the great patriotic war in the spirit of victory without considering who was on the good and evil side. So another uh, thing, another myth that was tackled by the opposition say director that was the myth of conquering the space there was biography of Gagarin uh, directly by Honienko a very good movie really and uh, in fact there was another film about it that is paper soldier which was uh, directed earlier by German the younger where the viewpoint is that of the doctor uh, preparing future cosmonauts to 
go into the space and the film shows that the whole myth of conquering the space is utopia. This is now the polluted Baikonur, uh, the worn and torn equipment and the frightened young uh, people who saw that if uh, one of them would fly, he would uh, die. So this is a kind of clash between the reality and, and myth. So here, this kind of uh, strand was in opposition to the official Russian cinema. And finally, uh, I would say that the critical uh, point, the critical uh, about uh, the USA was uh, Bahabanov films uh, charge uh, 2020 from uh, 2007. So, well, it was well, supposedly be based on true facts, but in fact it was adaptation of the asylum by Faulkner and Bies by Dostoevsky. So there is a lot of reference in it to utopian literature. So in my opinion, you should not read the film literally, but rather uh, like a metaphor. So the adaptation of, of that uh, past uh, and it's tr say transferred to 1984 and it was a shock for the public for many reasons because the empire was shown as a rottening uh, dead body and after this film there were no other let's say important cinemas if there are kind of films about the past and uh, the it is treated as continuation of the Bauabanov's line. And what is interesting that in the present day Russia, when Soviet films are screened, it's because there are no Hollywood movies anymore. So Bauabanov's is really um, greatly praised as uh, the visionary. Uh, propagating Great Russia, which is not uh, true because he was a great film ma ma maker. He had some nationalist elements, but he uh, also fought against them. And the only uh, film which is not uh, uh, shown and not mentioned is Charge 200. It seems to me that in recent years, the most interesting um, uh, down project is the most interesting. So it's a kind of multidisciplinary project, it's a film that is being made near Kharkiv and the um, specially erected um, Academy of uh, Sciences and the trauma of the Soviet Union was somehow uh, went through kind of uh, literally there were I don't know very few actors among hundreds of those appearing uh, cast in the film and those people lived for two years as if they lived in the USSR they also got married and was real they also became alcoholics and it was all observed uh, live let's say so they indeed uh, lived like that mm -hmm. they lived true lives like that so uh, the, the, I would not it would not be spoiler but the, the end is that everything is destroyed at the end the Institute is destroyed at the end and most of the heroes um, die but it's not real death this time but I don't know if you know this project if you've ever seen them or if you had any if you have had any experience with that because there are many films which you can uh, see online uh, at the moment uh, that is uh, a kind of uh, what they show is the trauma, uh, which is maybe not uh, lived through, but somehow played once again. So, and the discussion about it, oh, I mean, in some circles, could be a catalyst um, to have a critical thinking about the future of USSR, as opposed to this myth of victory and they need um, to rely on the empire. So that's it from me. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully, I uh, was on a schedule. Thank you so much. Everything is fine. So as regards the list of so many films, I would add uh, Breast in uh, the Space by Fyodorchenko, which is an attempt at uh, making um, both documentary and fiction film. And I would add Fyodor Chenka's uh, films like Anna and other that refer to the 
trauma and uh, suffering uh, on, in the uh, of, of the Soviet Union and uh, some kind of uh, reckoning. So thank you so much. Hopefully we will meet then uh, in person and discuss. So now uh, Tatiana Yarmoschuk, uh, let me give the floor. And uh, the journalist would speak uh, Ukrainian. The lady wants to speak Ukrainian. Pani redaktor, chcę pokazać stronę projektu, gdzie są już pierwsze teksty analizy. O, świetnie. Jo, jo. Until the 30th uh, anniversary of the collapse of the so Soviet Union, we want to prepare a project. And let me just, well, I will just present what sort of is the current time at, that's the Radio uh, Svoboda Department. And our auditory, that's the media channel. That's not only the channel, but also that's in uh, in Russian, and it's in it's for the post-Soviet uh, area. Although I don't like the post-Soviet era because it's actually when it comes to the epoch and uh, Central Asia as well as other countries, well, all that territory, well, how it should be determined. I don't really know because there's one one more uh, Russian term for this. I don't like it either. Well, I'll be speaking Ukrainian anyway because it's my first language. Uh, so basically, we're continuing the project. And uh, since I came from the Ukrainian uh, Radio Svoboda um, uh, program, and there is also another program for this, I realized that the central part of Central Asia, well, maybe, uh, well, since I was born in the Soviet Union and I graduated from school in 2000, however, that part of uh, uh, Caucasus and uh, Central Asia, well, actually, in sh at school we did not learn about that part. Well, I was working in Ukraine for the Ukrainian uh, part of uh, Radio Svoboda, so this was also not covered. As regards that project, I will not present everything for Ukraine, since there is Alexander Zinchenko, and there was a, a great documentary, and I was actually looking at, uh, well, I watched it from end to end. Let me focus on the problems that we uh, were confronted with. Well, I was actually asking the questions to the previous speakers from Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. Well, I realized that this is a very sensitive topic because it was written that someone from uh, both the uh, the um, you, uh, Armenian or Azerbaijani uh, service of the radio will tell me, why did you write this? So, for instance, they say Shusha, and, uh, and uh, in Armenia they say Shushi. Uh, so we just have to explain it. The same applies to the prepare, uh, preparation of the project. I was confronted with the complications. Well, basically, I was asking myself what would be, what would be better. I'm not talking about Ukraine or Ukraine and the Baltic states, Belarus uh, or uh, Moldova. Well, the information is uh, visible, and it also relates to Central Asia, Azerbaijan, because the conflict in conflict is quite deep, and it's even difficult to explain that how this or that part, well, 
will uh, well coming back to the to the topic when i was uh, traveling to armenia and azerbaijan i quoted the book which is actually the only work that was written about karabakh and uh, and actually, that was prepared by a Dutch journalist. And there's one more side uh, of uh, his, uh, uh, well, his advice is that basically regarding the conflict. So actually, about, uh, there were like 15 articles Three of them are supposed to be uh, published. The last one was uh, finished last week in uh, Armenia. And indeed, the information was, well, luckily, the eyewitnesses uh, are still alive. They're not so easy to find. However, it has all been gathered, systematized, And also, when I was writing about Tajikistan, I, it was just before, uh, actually, uh, the, uh, I, uh, I found out that the uh, Declaration of Independence uh, of Tajikistan coincided with the uh, Tajik um, Tajik uh, civil war and actually I didn't find any document about it I don't know why it happened but at least in Russian or English however there's still very little information only in Tajik well it we have to talked about the bloodless collapse of the Soviet Union However, well, but like, for instance, there have been such things like uh, 10 people died during the uh, attack on the uh, Vilnius TV station in Baku. Uh, 100 people were uh, killed with uh, minesweepers, uh, uh, spades. And in many territories, along with the collapse of the Soviet Union, conflicts started, including two conflicts in, in uh, Georgia, Abkhazia, Northern Ossetia. Also, the war started between Armenians and uh, Azerbaijanis about Karabakh. Also, civil war started in Tajikistan. Well, other than that, if we take into account the uh, Central Asian territories, well, actually, in the previous uh, discussion, the speakers said that there were conflicts about anything, among everything, including Tajiks, Uzbeks, and so on. Unfortunately, we talked also, when we were talking about the bloodless conflict, we somehow abstracted from those parts we failed to talk about. Well, I'm not capable of, of talking about it. I don't, I don't know if it has been discussed in Poland and what has not been discussed and what has been discussed. Well, anyway, when we started carrying on this project, we also said that if you take a look at each country and uh, their own movements, if you take into account the 10 years of uh, the Soviet Union, you can say that that formation was uh, also connected with uh, so such countries where there were some major conflicts that were published in the press. So we can say that those formations were discussed. Well, 
So, for instance, whether uh, Gorbachev was contemplating whether to send his troops there or not. If we're talking about the Soviet Union and we take a look at the whole complex of all the then republics and their road towards independence, their histories were so diverse. For instance, if you take into account Ukraine or the Baltics, there the whole anti-Soviet, anti-Sovietism started with uh, Ukrainians, uh, uh, Baltic residents. Well, for instance, Ukrainians remembered the Great Famine, um, uh, also, they also remember the occupation in, uh, in 1919. You can uh, say the same about the western part of Ukraine, the same re uh, related to Armenia. It all started with a different angle, actually. There were no anti-Russian moods. However, the first meeting in the then Soviet Union was in 65, and it was devoted to the 50, uh, 50th anniversary of the massive uh, killings of uh, Armenians that has in the uh, Ottoman Empire. So, if we're talking about the anti-Russian or anti-Soviet movement, actually, to a degree, some degree of patriotism was allowed. And uh, when I was talking to Georgians and Armenians, well, they admitted, for instance, like, for instance, what they could talk about. So in Ukraine, uh, in Ukraine, people would go to prison for saying that, and they didn't. And for instance, also, there have been parallel tracks in each um, republic. For instance, in the Soviet times, there was so-called uh, complex, uh, to call it violence of structure. Yes, yeah, structural. Uh, yeah, that subjected part of um, residents to oppression. Well, so that violence was directed, first of all, by the Soviet Union towards rural residents. So, for instance, the Soviet Union, even though Soviet Union was called the uh, country of workers and farmers, however, it was much better to be uh, a, it was much cooler to be a worker than a farmer. If you take into account the majority of uh, the then Soviet republics and take into account where the language traditions was, first of all, preserved, it was mostly in rural areas. However, on the other hand, the Soviet unions imposed the complex of a rural Resident, I remember when I came to learn to Kiev. It was in in the twentieth century, and actually, it wasn't that strong back then. But you could still sense that if you spoke Ukrainian, you must come from peripheral areas. Right now, the situation is luckily changing. However, there's one interesting thing. Those uh, national movements started in the post-Soviet community. So there has been like a reverse process. Indeed, in the former republics, the national movements started with uh, the written language. 
It started with journalists who spoke in, who wrote in their national languages. That were actually spoken in all the other countries, except for Geor uh, Georgia and Armenia. There were just two such republics, Georgia and uh, Armenia, where the Armenian and Georgian language enjoyed some status. That also remained. And in the Soviet Union, at the end of the 80s, the uh, national re uh, uh, rebirth was actually started. So laws were passed in the uh, former Soviet republics, admitting the official status to the languages of all the national republics. Maybe there will be some questions. I can speak a lot about it. Thank you very much. OK, let's do it like this, that the questions will be asked after our meeting. And now, do we have uh, a connection with uh, Alexandra Zivchenko? Yes, of course. Uh, e Oddaję panu głos w języku, który sam pan wybierze, tak aby to był wstęp do filmu siódma część została uzgodniona, prawda? Zapytam się tego organizatora. Well, I will ask now uh, organizer a question about uh, this film because it takes uh, 45 minutes, no, 50 minutes and we will screen it. So if so, uh, you have 20 minutes for your introduction because the film is quite long, so rich and has an ambitious title, Ukraine conquered the empire of evil. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much. I just would like to say that the idea for this name of the film was uh, created in the Warsaw University in 2016. So it was not me uh, who came up with this uh, uh, title. It was um, the um, um, Eastern Review, and uh, in 2016 I received uh, an award for uh, Ukrainian part of Katyn. Um, so I had a pleasure and an opportunity for about 3.5 hours, um, more or less, um, um, uh, the, the uh, President Stanislav Shushkevich was uh, uh, just uh, before me, and I said during my short uh, um, uh, acknowledgement that uh, uh, I'm sorry, but I just would like to um, uh, uh, um, thank you for destroying USSR. And after this uh, uh, ceremony, uh, we had the conversation with President Shushkevich. Uh, thank you very much uh, for acknowledging me by yourself, but I just would like to say that USSR was not abolished by us, by Ukrainians and Kravchuk. And about half an hour after that, he um, explained why he fought like that. And maybe I will go into Ukrainian. I understand that I am not able to uh, go into the Ukraine because I have not talked uh, in Polish uh, for half a year. Uh, so I would like to... Uh, uh, um, I just would like to say what Ukrainians have uh, destroyed. It was irony or auto irony because if if we were able to understand the whole process, 
this fact uh, had a lot of authors and in fact this film is finished uh, the series uh, you can uh, see it uh, who in fact uh, abolished the Soviet Union. I will not open, I will not uh, reveal all the secrets at the moment, but I would like to say that, um, that uh, it is obvious that um, such a film could have been done by Poles, how Poles um, destroyed uh, the Soviet Union, how Lithuanians um, um, uh, did it. So um, this uh, could be uh, done also by Georgians, because these were the main nations in the fount of the historic monster that Soviet Union was. And I would like everybody to present each version of their story, how they destroyed the Soviet Union. So this is a very important moment for us. In the first uh, um, um, chapters which, will, which were shown, um, uh, and also other Polish language channels are to show it. So in the first zones, we wanted to show how it looked like from the Ukrainian point of view. So there were a lot of films uh, which showed about the uh, Russian approach to this. Uh, so both in the 90s and uh, at the beginning of the 2000s. Um, so unfortunately there was no Ukrainian film where you could show well, that this is 100% uh, uh, Ukrainian view to this issue. And here you can see a few moments that you could define as the key ones. Uh, the ones which are connected with the uh, activities of the Ukrainian Democratic Forces and also activities of the Communist Party of Ukraine. This was the first activity. Uh, it starts uh, from 86, uh, from the catastrophe in Chernobyl. So it had a great influence on Ukrainian society, both on opposition and communists. So uh, this is just the connecting or triggering power. The point is that Chernobyl was a situation whereby it was much worse um, than Cheka, uh, KGB, or Communist uh, Party. People uh, ceased to, afraid, to be afraid of so what they think. Um, and the participants and uh, witnesses talk about it in um, about it but at that time this uh, fear against the center disappeared also um, when we talked about the communists in kiev so the communist party was in a situation whereby um, you could um, tackle a problem uh, that was created by the center um, at this point, Kiev had to deal with opposition against uh, um, uh, uh, instead of uh, Moscow. So it was the intermediary um, uh, stage. So I understand. Uh, I, I remember. Um, uh, Mr. Nishi, who was the chairman of the board, Poltavska board, uh, national board, which was breathing this air, and he witnessed all the problems uh, which were connected with the um, um, explosion in uh, Chernobyl nuclear power, uh, power plant. And Kravchuk understood that uh, bit by bit in Ukraine you can see a process that sooner or later will uh, go into the political level. And when the first meeting that took place in 
1988, so two years after the Chernobyl catastrophe. At the current uh, contemporary uh, Troyetsk um, Square, Olympic Square, 40,000 people gathered on Hreshetik, and obviously it was not um, allowed to organize such meetings. Uh, so here we could talk about the beginning of this movement. So here uh, it uh, uh, meant that um, this is the impulse which shows that apart from the agenda, ecological agenda, there is also uh, the effect, political effect, uh, social effect, national effect. Uh, it's got additional uh, button. So we have the additional process and the domino effect starts. And again, I don't want to repeat the whole story. Uh, it uh, was, uh, it happened in the Polish round table and about the solidarity, uh, about everything what happened and uh, everything was talked about here. So it was important for the process and for the discussion in Ukraine. So here, uh, quite a lot of participants of the round table uh, talked uh, about the um, representatives uh, of the opposition, like Adam Michnik uh, with Ivanov or Mitropolitko. These were the leaders uh, of the movement uh, or the Republican Party, who on a regular basis uh, was, were coming to Poland and uh, breathing the Polish atmosphere because Poland was a few years ahead of Ukraine. And during the situation, uh, during the 90s, uh, after the revolution, uh, when this uh, um, uh, um, revolution of uh, pride, dignity, so they were represent the decision makers, current decision makers, uh, anti-communist uh, um, uh, were represented, and they come to the um, meeting, and they want Kravchuk to Kravchuk to sign. Uh, the agreement and Kravchuk realized that this situation is very complex. But one of the key uh, moments that we see in this uh, in this uh, uh, film, so we can say what we see in this film. So this is the moment when uh, it was organized um, about. Um, this future things and the influence over their activities um, on the 27th of uh, june in kiev there were election held um, it may sound strange but in fact this meeting of the parliament in kiev was uh, um, uh, um, um, cre uh, triggered um, a committee for the um, um, special state in the um, things, and then the declaration of uh, independence of Ukraine was adopted. Obviously, Ukrainian communists were fighting very strongly to stop uh, this. Uh, nevertheless, the new uh, a uh, union um, agreement was supposed to be uh, prepared as the opposition to the Declaration of Independence. So it was added that the declaration requires um, signing new, uh, new uh, union agreement, but it didn't happen because in Ukraine, uh, 
uh, we had very strong protests because now Ukraine uh, wants to have their own army, their own ministers, um, uh, so more sovereignty and more autonomy. And when this was published, um, and then the Supreme Board started to discuss over it, so then some of the um, decisions of this uh, union there were many things concluded with this, um, uh, just um, concluded in it uh, thanks to the Ukrainian communists. So here we can say that uh, these uh, um, things were announced in uh, Moscow and they said, well, you know, we will um, uh, leave it. And then the Vice Prime Minister stands up and says, well, in fact, let's give, give us a time to the working working group until the 1st of November 1991. We will not hurry, there is no need to hurry up. And deputies were offended. They said that's a long period of time. We will wait. So we can uh, wait for two weeks. Um, and this situation uh, looked at them uh, in the following way. This bureaucratic uh, uh, thing looked differently from the Moscow perspective. Uh, Moscow uh, um, uh, hard-headed like Krychkov or a KGB uh, boss or Pavlov or the Minister of Defense, uh, Yazov, understood that this is the end of the Soviet Union. And refusal to sign the um, uh, Union Treaty um, by Ukraine meant that Ukraine leaves the uh, uh, Soviet Union, that Soviet Union collapses. Because the uh, Union uh, was uh, left by the Baltic states, and since Ukraine uh, played this role, so the future members of the Committee for the Special State, Special Situation, we had Um, um, uh, when we know what happened after the Anaev, uh, uh, then we have um, what what happened uh, when we had the subsequent processes. Um, how we have a situation um, um, what was the conflict uh, between? Kiev and Russia, which was uh, written in the papers that Moscow can put the nuclear bomb on Ukraine. You will find out about it uh, um, uh, from the last episode of the uh, film, how Ukrainians uh, destroyed the uh, imperial of uh, Evil. We have uh, the uh, Miss Godlevska, Tatiana Yarmushok, uh, um, uh, Alexander Zinchenko. Are there any uh, short questions from the room before we start listening to uh, watching the film? Would you like to ask anybody uh, to um, our um, panelists? Yes, please. Oh, uh, please uh, take the microphone. So, okay, so a brief question, uh, Madam Journalist said. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay. So, Madam uh, um, Journalist said that this uh, term, the um, post-Soviet, let's say, area or space, maybe it's not now, uh, let's say, very successful, but 
if we call it uh, the post, let's say, satellite area, would it change something in the perception of uh, the public? But what is the question about? So, yeah, we could uh, change it, of course, change the ter term. I mean, to have post satellite instead of post totalitarian. I guess uh, this is a broader area. So, I've been thinking really about it. If we look at the word totalitarian, uh, post uh, Hitler, German is also post totalitarian state. Maybe uh, it may have a different meaning, it seems to me at least. So, okay. So, at least, uh, in fact, the part of the European Union, which was then the common market, referred uh, to the heritage of Charlemagne, of uh, the king who died so many, many years ago that he was unable to be connected to, to the Union. My uh, patron, Saint uh, Hubert, was Maastricht um, uh, patron, but he was not the patron of the European Union. It's a complex issue, anyhow. And uh, questions to Dr. maybe um, Godlewska now? Because I, Gorlewska, sorry, I would have one question to you. Why didn't you notice um, the works of art? Maybe I, I couldn't hear it. By Fyodorchenko, Alexei Fyodorchenko, Alexei, we might say. Uh, the war uh, did not let me, did not let him make a film in Kharkiv. So. Doctor, could you respond to that, please? Yes. Are you with us? Yes. Yes, of course. I mean, I very greatly appreciate this director. I think he's one of the most important uh, contemporary directors now because uh, he makes very regional uh, films, uh, very much uh, set in uh, the localities that he knows he comes from, he's attached to. So there is a film, Angels of the Revolution. This could be the film that could be sort of included here. But I must admit, for practical reasons, uh, it, it has not appeared because I write, wrote my dissertation. I mean, the book was written more or less uh, when there was the premiere of, of that uh, film. So it could not have been included into that whole list. But I think that if we think about Fyodorchenko as this voice in this kind of many voices about the Soviet Union and its heritage at present, that would be a kind of separate voice. Because if I remember it well, even in this film, uh, the angels of the revolutions, angels do not uh, win, in fact, totally. They are somehow absorbed by the culture, by the local culture. And this is a kind of clash uh, that is uh, not successful, and Bolsheviks did not succeed, and it all gets mixed into amalgamate, but it is not a, a centrally controlled uh, republic. So the question is yes. The answer, sorry, to the question is yes, but maybe in brackets or in to, to sub and with some supplement, I would say I would treat it differently compared to to the other uh, films that were about kind of uh, about the center, let's say, about uh, traditionally understood uh, Russian culture. And Fedorchenko is uh, regional enough to be a separate voice, right? Thank you so much. Uh, and now I publicly promise that I will write uh, to you, doctor, and then we will be able to really mm, and discuss these issues a lot. And it is really fascinating. Any more questions uh, from the floor? Please, Ambassador. Uh, 
I'm asking if the film by Grossman, uh, Life and Destiny, is not part of that convention. I mean, of course, other films such as uh, uh, You Can't Live Like That. It's hor showing in a horrible way alcoholism in Russia at the time of the uh, collapse. But uh, the film uh, Life and Destiny really impressed me. And I think because if we have this convention as a review of these kind of reckoning films, this is a very valuable piece of art. Let's, uh, I must admit I haven't seen it. Well, I will watch it, definitely. Yes, I will, but I don't know it. So thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to thank you, ladies, panelists, uh, Dr. Um, Gorlewska and uh, journalist uh, Tetiana uh, Jarmoszczuk and uh, Mr. Um, Oleksandr Zinchenko. But we will meet him in a moment on the screen. So I'd like to thank all of you who are here with, with us. And I'd like to thank also the interpreters. And well, now let's uh, see the film seven. This is a very important uh, digit, the last seventh wave, so the decisive one, that is, it would be tsunami. So now I would like to invite everyone to the cinema for the screening. Thank you. Thank you.